All right. Hello. Welcome to Adventures in Lolly Gaggin. Uh, we are back to playing Call of Cthulhu after a brief week off. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're, we're still in Savannah. We got a few little things left that we're going to kind of poke around with, see what happens. Uh, but we're excited to get back. Uh, we had a really fun last session, had some very big time interrogations with some info dropping. So if you haven't uh, caught episode three, definitely go check that out. Uh, but, uh, but there's some, some interesting things, uh, interesting things to happen. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that are still on the plate. Uh, we'll see how, uh, how Carruthers treats you all now that you're returning with actual, uh, permission to go on the grounds this time. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but, um, why don't we do a quick hello to everybody to say who you are, who you're playing, that kind of thing. We'll go through these fast and then we'll start up. Uh, and we will waste no time. So Steven, tell us who are you playing? I'm playing Pastor Wood, a uh, reverend that's been traveling across the Southwest and a uh, former Texas Ranger. So I've got some experience detecting. You sure do. You sure do. We haven't seen any of that yet, but uh, we're just going to assume. Uh, but we'll find out. <laughs> I don't know why I'm being mean. Uh, next up, <laughs> Melissa. Tell us about Marie. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, Marie Wynn is a. Uh, jazz singer uh under the name of sissy may uh she is super charming and charismatic and persuasive and all of the things that involve like talking people into things and uh charming people and all of the rest of all of that good stuff indeed and you are a very important say this a woman who can keep a secret uh which is why you're here you just have to figure out what that secret yes. is everybody else does and they realize that melissa is secretly an old one and uh yeah, we were we were theorizing that possibly the old one is the plane and Frank Kearns, the pilot, might turn around at some point. <laughs> Maybe it's no. Marie this whole time. Uh, Marie is the thing. That's what it is. Uh, next up. Oh, no. My Trey, tell us about Shima. Hello, I'm uh, playing Shima Oran. She is a uh, library studies uh, major at University of Miskatonic, and she's there in a full ride wrestling school. I mean, you know, we're, we're not very good, but but I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> I, I love it. We got to get some merch that's like Miskatonic University wrestling gear, like wrestling yeah. team gear. Oh. We got to do that. Merch idea. <laughs> Someone write that down. Oh, uh, goodness. I doubt Miskatonic. We can put Miskatonic University on stuff. That's that's fine. We're not going to get in trouble with that. I uh, think so. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I like I was thinking initially just like you know like shirts sweaters that kind of thing but I'm like what about the unitard stuff no no it's probably a bad idea <laughs> <But> again, <laughs> it's not bad. I, 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 I can promise you you'll sell at least one <laughs> for sure for sure that's what we if we go to Gen Con next year everyone just trots in wearing unitards front side Miskatonic University whatever wrestling you know, university wrestling team. backside lollygaggers just kind of just repping that. No one wants I'll do to it. see I'll do it. that. So I'm going to be the manager <laughs> of the wrestling team. I'll have the clipboard. Oh, God. Sweat. God, could you imagine? Just, could yeah. you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> I want so one much. of those big jackets, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Eric will wear one. See? He's a really one. <laughs> wear it at the North Spiral Tree. <laughs> yeah, I'm just picturing it now. Just picture it. Oh, goodness. Uh, Ashley, tell us about Beverly. I am playing Dr. Beverly Key. She is our professor in anthropology. Uh, and she has brought Shima along with her to help grease the wheel socially. She's getting along great with Marie and Shima. Because uh, as we witnessed in our previous interview, sometimes she just social cues don't always hit for Dr. Beverly Key. And she can be I a forgot how hard she went. A little insensitive. <laughs> oh, that was so great. <laughs> <laughs> no, but she's trying, you know. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. Fantastic. It was Dr. great. Dr. Beverly Key. Uh, and then finally, Wong, tell us about Patrick Price. I'm Bob of Patrick Price. I've got a knife for appraisal and steady fast hands. <laughs> That's true. And you're getting better at locksmithing uh, by the minute, apparently. Uh, uh, uh. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. He is so just a barber, nothing he's just a barber. else. Just a barber. <laughs> just like Ben Affleck was just an accountant in the accountant. Patrick exactly. Price is just a barber. Okay. 
the last session, you all spent most of your time in Joy Grove Sanitarium. Primarily, you were interviewing two patients, Douglas Henslow, uh, who you basically had a bunch of letters between Henslow and Walter Winston, well, from Henslow to Walter Winston, uh, and another patient, Edgar Job. Uh, Henslow, he explained how he was a former associate of Walter Winston, again, who was the deceased father of your uh, your patron, Janet Winston Rogers. Uh, and they, the two men worked together in 1924 to track down what they considered and labeled a dangerous cult. And they followed this sort of drug trail back to Los Angeles. And that was sort of uh, the headquarters, it seemed. Uh, Walter and Henslow it turned out they were the only survivors of their investigative team, of which there were a few other folks. Uh, and Henslow explained how the team interrupted a, a cult ritual where they were summoning what he called a thing uh, that immediately began tearing people apart. He barely even saw it. He ran. Uh, despite surviving, Henslow does believe that his team ultimately failed and that the cult probably still continues in some form till today. Uh, but he was very relieved and almost insisted on you all taking over 1936, continuing the investigation, that sort of thing. And then he gave you a signed piece of paper that would hopefully give you access to the Henslow estate where he has apparently hid various items from 1924 of import. Now, the other interview, the other interrogation was Edgar Job, who turns out is a former cult member, this very cult, uh, who traveled to Savannah hoping to make amends for his past deeds. At least that's what he claims. And unfortunately, he had a violent altercation with Henslow. That resulted in both of them being legally committed to Joy Grove Sanitarium now. Joe became um, involved with the cult. He kind of gave you a little bit of his history while he was attending UCLA. And one of his professors, George Ayers, connected Edgar to a man by the name of Ramon Echeverria. Now, that was what he perceived or at least described as the leader of the cult. They didn't really have a name. They were just like Echeverria's people, basically. Uh, now, that man, uh, he was known... Uh, for throwing very lavish parties filled with sex and drugs and all sorts of weird behaviors that kind of enticed him as a young college student. Uh, Echeverria died that night during the summoning, along with a bunch of other cultists. And Job explained that they kind of gave you a little bit more detail that they were trying to summon an entity, Golgoroth or the thing with a thousand mouths or the fisher from the outside. And he kind of talked about how things of this age have a bunch of different, different names uh, the interrogations themselves uh, gave you a lot of information, but there's other things as well. Patrick, as we noted before, broke into Dr. Keaton's office and he learned that the psychiatrist was engaging in some ethically questionable treatments, including confrontation therapy between the two men. And uh, he seemed to be very fascinated by the shared psychosis. It's how we refer to it between the, the two of them and wants to write a book about them. Uh, also, while at the sanitarium, Pastor Wood you had a very strange observation where you just noticed this peculiar shape in the stained wallpaper of the cafeteria, which inexplicably turned into a gnashing mouth that just quickly disappeared. Marie and Beverly and Shime, I kind of looked into it some more and they discovered some strange runes and these figures that were drawn into the walls around the sanitarium that Edgar Job kind of told you and based upon what your own research suggests that they were drawing for protection, uh, whatever that means. Uh, now the next day, you all decided to drive back to the Henslow estate now that you have permission to be there. And that's when Marie had a very disturbing daydream. Uh, she watched as a, a headless deer was racing alongside the car out in the sort of the swamp, the country roads. But then even more terrifying, a maw, like a mouth, grew within and upon her belly. It was biting. It was gnashing through her clothes and her skin until she finally awoke there in the back seat of the car. She discovered that her shirt was kind of damp. She had fallen asleep. Uh, and the car had come to a stop and apparently it was some sort of basic work that was being done. Uh, so we're going to pick up right then and there. I'm going to need Marie. Uh, you're in the back seat. We'll say some of you can be inside. Some of you can be outside. Doesn't matter. Uh, but I'm going to need Marie to make a very, uh, very interesting sand test, please. Okay. Starting right off rolling for sand. Yep. As this was a very disturbing dream. And when you, Touch your stomach. You can feel the dampness. So right. that was a 61 over 60. So yep. close. Very, very so close. So close. Take two points of sanity loss. Uh, as between the dream and between this strange, like this sort of surprising dampness that uh, suddenly uh, has appeared on your stomach as, as waking up. It might just be the humidity. It might just be the heat. Uh, but that is the exact spot 
or in your dream that um, that disgusting maw mouth began to uh, began to function. Uh, so, um, so, what do you do with that, Marie? Yeah, it, basically at this point, she's just going to kind of sit up and just sort of just in a very unladylike fashion, just like scramble out of the back seat of the car. And she's just like, just kind of clutching at her, um, her stomach because she wears, you know, kind of like a, a suit with a blouse underneath. And she, again, is just sort of like unbuttoning the suit and unbuttoning blouse and just kind of like rubbing at her stomach and just sort of very, um, not necessarily engaging with anyone yet, but just very like distressed and, you know, as if there were some, you know, sort of like insect crawling on her or something. And she's just, no, 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 no. Shima immediately sees this kind of slightly frantic and panicked look on on your face and everything. And and kind of what... Everything okay, Miss Wynn? Are you all right? No, 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 not, 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 in, not in the least, my dear, not in the least. Uh, uh, do- Doctor Key, so, uh, something's the matter. Uh, okay, uh, and I really will walk. Miss Wynn, uh, can I assist you? Uh, didn't, uh th- th- and I and she sort of turns away from any gentle folk that might be around. And she's like, I don't, I have nothing. There's nothing that I find, right? Nothing. I look, look. look. Yeah. And Beverly will do the whole thing where she has Shima help block and she'll discreetly take a peek. And which uh, Shima, Shima can do being a half the size of a man range. So, uh, <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> uh, and then she doesn't have a wound or anything. Correct. Jeff. Uh, you're actually going to inspect? Uh, yeah. No, 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 no. All you can see, uh, definitely her like her blouse, her shirt, whatever um, the garb actually is, Marie. Uh, it is it is very damp. Um, I would say that in general, it's Georgia. It's uh, it's October, um, and it's still quite warm uh, and very humid. And today specifically. It's very overcast. So even standing out mm. on the road, you can see like very heavy, heavy clouds. So like the humidity levels are, are significant. And you guys have been six of you because you've got you've hired your driver have crammed into a vehicle. Uh, and so it is not comfortable uh, for anyone. So it's so all of you um, and more than likely, most of you are kind of stepping out of the car here or there. Maybe you're helping the driver with some of the repairs, whatever it might be. Uh, but all of you are probably sweating to some degree. Um, but Marie's belly, especially, um, is, is soaking wet, but you don't notice, um, you don't notice any blood. You don't notice any cuts. If you, if you are, if you step away to the side and you kind of actually peek underneath it, the skin is unbroken, Mm -hmm. nothing like that. Well, I'm not seeing any open injuries, but you are heating up uh maybe it's a fever dream of some kind uh and i uh she'll go through back into the car and like her her bag or whatever that she has and get like a paper out and she'll kind of fold it into a fan and she'll come back to you and she'll help like try and cool you off a bit and uh yeah and and if i may what what was it that you thought you saw Oh well, y- you know, and and, and Doctor Key here j- just said dream, and well, um, hmm, that was, I was, I did doze, I did doze off, so just that it was just a, a just a dream, but oh boy, that that felt more than more than just a. Um, I- I'm sorry, Pastor, you asked what. Yes, what was it you saw? And do not discredit what you saw because it was a dream. The devil works through your subconscious as well as your conscious. Uh, he, cer- certainly. Um, and we've heard, I mean, we've heard some stories earlier today. I can imagine that had quite a bit to do with what I saw. And so she'll recount sort of, you know, the the headless deer. and Beverly's know, the... like, Shima, write this down. <laughs> As she's as she's waving, 
make no mistake, we are under attack right now. I I have seen the devil work, and he is attacking you right now. Shall we gather in prayer? Oh, well, I, that would, um, and she'll sort of compose herself for a second and just say, I, Pastor, I'm sure that will be quite, uh, Lord, please grant your blessing you upon us. Give us your protection in our time of need in this dark hour. Do not let those evil, evil beings affect us and discourage us from pursuing the truth that we must find. Shama put her hands together and like opens one eye to see like what everybody else is doing. <laughs> you also, you see Pastor Wood, his eyes are clenched shut and he's got his hand up. Oh, um, can you and, also and Marie <laughs> didn't change at all. Like this was kind of a like this is gonna like hell. Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. But if Shima like peeks one eye open, like Marie just sort of winks because she's got eyes open. Beverly's just would, waving. Pastor Wood would keep going, and then I assume that at some point, like the driver would like drop a tool or something, and that would just make Pastor Wood realize he's got to wrap up. Uh, sure. And then he'd just, Amen, Amen. Put your hat back on. So while that's been going on, we'll say uh, the driver has got the hood up a little bit, just kind of looking at things, and has more than once asked Patrick, uh, since Patrick hasn't yet been part of this to kind of take this little um, kind of carafe or this little uh, pitcher that the man has and to go fill it up in the, in the, the sort of the swamp, the Creek down there, and then kind of fill it up as it seems there's a bunch of steam and such coming out uh, of the engine itself. Um, Patrick, if you would like uh, just to fish for a roll here, just go roll, just give us, give us a little mechanical repair roll as you come back and as the, the you and the driver have been kind of tinkering around. I know this isn't your cup of tea, but like, give it a go. I've seen the insides of a car before. I'll roll <laughs> up my sleeves, fetch a pitcher. Okay. This mucky water. Okay. Start pouring it all over everything. <laughs> <laughs> 45, that's a fail. Would you like to <laughs> yeah, spend right. 35? No, don't, don't spend that luck. Oh, I have 34. I would have. Do- Oh, you couldn't even do it anyway. Uh, oh. Yeah, I could do it. I knew I could have made it the good <laughs> luck out of you. Excellent. Um, so the the delay is not that long, um, and your driver is most apologetic about it. Uh, and then just like, it's just days like, days like today, just every now and then, just kind of gets a little little hot, and it gets a little overheated, and there's well, there's quite a quite a few of us that we're kind of carrying around, so sometimes the I, it'll, it'll be it'll be up in a moment, and I don't don't worry. Now we'll I'll, I'll make sure to to make mention to to the, the office at home to to go ahead and uh, make discount on your on your invoice and everything at the very end of this. I, I am so very so very sorry about that, uh, but I think we are we are ready to go. If you all are ready to con- continue, uh, I'd be more than happy to take you. Uh, and you guys are probably like it's it's at this point between the drive out here between like morning odds and ends that you probably did it's probably early afternoon something like that around lunchtime that kind of thing um and uh he's 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 ready to go if you guys are and marie will go over to pastor wood and her, her upbringing her family uh definitely kind of followed a strong faith tradition and she'll just kind of kind of pat uh pastor wood on the shoulder and just say, I, I must say that uh, it does appear that uh, Southern pastors have a bit of a different approach to the work than uh, what I grew up with in Chicago, but it is uh, uh, insightful to see uh, just what the differences are, but it certainly brings comfort. Much appreciated. Well, Southerners are always known for working harder than Northerners. We must stay ever vigilant. That, that is one way to uh, look at differences between North and South. Uh, but but again, thank, thank you, Pastor. Ma'am. Okay, so you guys all climb back into the car. Uh, sheepish grin on the driver's face uh, when they start it back up. And like you almost, speaking of prayers, you almost think they're kind of praying when they do it. And then eventually it does turn over. And you all continue uh, on your drive out to the Henslow State, which isn't much further away, probably about a half an hour or so. Uh, bumpy roads, again, increasingly becoming less and less paved until they're just sort of clay and dirt. 
Uh, you can see the heavy vegetation, uh, hanging Spanish moss, kind of almost like strangling the roads in certain places. There's no sign of the sun today. It's just like overcast clouds. You can see even distant thunder, you know, thunderstorms and uh, storm clouds like on a horizon. You've had an occasional sprinkle here and there for like a moment or two, but it's really just a light spritz. It's nothing at all heavy, but more than once, like your drive's like, well, storms come uh, over and over again here and there. Um, but eventually you make it and you are, you see the familiar um, sort of entry road that goes to this wrought iron fence. Uh, there is a decently high like uh, brick wall that extends out and away from the wrought iron fence itself. Uh, as Patrick knows, it goes they go around like three quarters of the property. There's like one side sinking into the swamp that isn't covered by the wall any further. Uh, but otherwise, wrought iron gates, you can see the bells hanging nearby. Uh, and beyond it, there's that kind of plantation style house with somewhat wraparound porch and columns and stuff sort of. From a distance, shining white, Patrick, you would know up close it looks much less, uh, much less white. Um, the driver's idea, um, I can wait on here if your party is a uh, is waiting, uh, and uh, I'm more than happy to uh, to spend time just sitting around and I can drive you back to the city if that's what you plan. We would be much obliged. Oh, absolutely. After uh, it'd be probably good for for a vehicle to kind of calm down a bit and. Uh, uh, and I do believe that I, I might be able to fetch some gasoline from some friendly farms around here. So I can, if you don't mind, I can go uh, drive down. And I'll be back in, uh, well, uh, in maybe an hour or two. And, uh, and and we'll be ready ready to go. Right as rain. Well, hopefully not too much rain. I do you, have sir. a decent mechanical repair. Would uh, giving a look at the engine help in any meaningful way right now before we left? Uh, probably not anything anything meaningful right now. It's more just like okay. he just wants to get some gas, basically. I, I won't bother them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. So you have uh, you see the car kind of turn around, leave. You got the wrought iron finch. Presumably, one of you hits the bell, and you see you hear the sounds of like the distant dogs barking, and you see emerging from that cottage, you see the aged Carruthers. Uh, kind of moving along. You see the three dogs is like kind of big hound dogs around him. Uh, and he's using like this, like pitchfork, almost like a walking stick as he comes up and he's like, mm, it's y'all again. I told y'all, uh, well, you ain't accepting visitors. Well, in, in fact, sir, you, you told us that, uh, you would be accepting visitors if we had a letter, uh, from, uh, Mr. Henslow and, uh, we followed up with your request. And you uh, do you hand the you do you hand it over to him? I assume. Yeah, so he can verify. Takes a look at it. You're not even sure if he reads it. Just kind of takes a look at it. Mm. All right. And then he opens up the gate. The gate like does that classic <laughs> as it kind of creaks the the iron kind of scraping across each other. You see little flecks of rust fall onto the ground. Uh, and she's like, oh, come on in. Um, mind the dogs. They, uh, they're friendly, but they're a bit ornery at the same time. Well, come on up. Uh, all of you, come on. Let's go. And um, he closes the gates, and then he starts to lead you up to the house. Uh, and as he's doing, he's like kind of pointing around. He's like, grounds, go off yonder, back into the swamp. Uh, you won't find much out there. Uh, opens the door to the front of the house, kind of lets you all in. Uh, you can see there's a staircase, like almost immediately inside the house. And he's like, Mother Henslow, uh, her room's at the top of the stairs. Uh, try not to disturb her. Uh, I'll be over in my cottage if you need me. Uh, that- um, could you perhaps point us in the direction of Francis Hicker? Mm. Hickory. Hickory, pardon. I don't know that name. Okay. Perhaps there's a library nearby? Mm. He kind of pulls his hat off and kind of scratches his head. Uh, uh, Mr. Hanslow, uh, his room's got some books and things. Uh, it's because dang we got to a library. Okay. Well, thank you for your hospitality. 
Mm -hmm. Puts his hat back on. Takes two steps through the creak of the of the uh, of the front porch, and he turns around again. Uh, Lady Miss Angela, oh yeah, yeah. Is Who's she not feeling well? Mm. She feels the way she usually feels, but she, she don't feel that good. You just all be uh, be mindful, respectful. Yeah. All right. We're not looking to cause excitement. Mm-hmm. And then he continues off towards the uh, towards his cottage. Um, yeah. So in you're inside, Patrick. You peeked inside before uh, here and there, but you actually haven't been inside yet. Um, I mean, right off the bat, you notice that paint is peeling. You notice that rugs here and there, even the ones you're standing on, like this little runner in the middle of this opening hall, very worn, flat. Um, faded even to some degree. Uh, you can see there's some lights here and there, but the bulbs are kind of burned out. You can see the little kind of black stains here and there. Overall, the the place has kind of a kind of a damp smell, like damp plaster, like stale flowers, that sort of thing. Uh, and the other distinct smell, um, Marie, you have a pet, right? Yes, a cat. You very much immediately, Marie, get the scent of cat boxes. Like you can it's like it's it's mm. almost overpowering to agree. Uh, and then you can okay. see that the windows are open here and there. Some of them are screened and you can get a lot of those swamp smells are like sweeping into the house as well. Um, you can see that the ground floor that you're in, some high ceilings here and there, got some large windows that Patrick, you've peered into. You see some of the fireplaces. There's a parlor. There's a main hall that you're standing in now, stairwell going up. You know that there's a kitchen in here as well, Patrick, and a dining room. Uh, and there's like a servant's area as well. Um, that's all kind of around here. And you would imagine some of the uh, like the living quarters, bedrooms and things are upstairs. What would you all like to do? I would like to head to Mr. Henslow's room and take a look at some of those books. And Perhaps one on. of the authors might be named Hickory. Okay. Uh, who who would be going with Pastor, and is anyone going anywhere else? Uh, Sham, Shama is going with the Pastor. Well, I would assume we would have met the man in the house, but looks like we have free reign. So well, we split I off. would definitely like to uh, have a conversation with the lady of the house and make sure that she is uh, duly informed that there are uh, individuals that she is uh, sharing her home with at this present moment. Ma'am, I believe we were told not to disturb her. Oh, that, that is not what I took uh, Mr. Carruthers to say. More that uh, we should not be upsetting her, but that it was perfectly acceptable for us to have a pleasant conversation. And so Marie is going to go, I think, because it was up the stairs, which is where yeah. her room was. Well, both both places, like the her room and also um, referencing to, uh, Douglas's room. Uh, okay. So, Marie, you're going to try to go appeal to uh, Mrs. Virginia Henslow, Pastor, yes. and Shima. You're going into Douglas's room. Um, Patrick and Beverly, where are the two of you headed? I'll be downstairs. To I'll head to the kitchen. Maybe prep some okay. beverages. Okay. Is there uh, like a office or like drawing room, I guess? You can it, it just basically are you looking around on the first floor or just kind of poke yeah, around? Yeah, she'll, as best you can? she'll sure. look around the first floor. Okay. All right. Uh, so we split up a little bit. Um, Pastor Wood, Shima, and Marie, you're upstairs. Beverly and Patrick, you stay uh, you stay downstairs. Um, we'll start with the downstairs folk. So kitchen wise, Patrick, it smells pretty terrible in here. It smells like garbage uh, as you just kind of hit you in the face a bit. Um, you can see that there's bread on the counter. Um, now that you're inside, now that you're not just looking through a screen, you can see it's molding, uh, very clearly. Um, there's a handful of, um, there's a handful of decent things here that you might be able to like pull out of like these various jars and containers. You can probably set up some, like a, like a little, uh, like a teapot stuff going on, on sort of the, the stove. Uh, so you can certainly get that going. Um, Beverly 
if you're looking around um, for an office, there's nothing like that. The closest thing as you're looking around is there is a parlor, uh, which is like old school, like hosting rooms, basically. Like it's it's basically what a living room is these days, sort of, kind of. Um, but one thing you can tell, which is sort of surprising, is that the furniture in here seems like it's never been sat on before. Like you can just, there's, there's layers of dust uh, that suggests like she probably hasn't hosted uh, in quite some time. Uh, but you do notice that there is like this, this open barrel top desk uh, that's sitting in here. Uh, there's a couple ledgers and things on, on the, on the, uh, on the countertop as well. Um, and I'll say other thing, Patrick, is that there's um, near the kitchen, there is like a servant stairwell as well. Uh, and it does look like some of those steps just looking at it looks a little dangerous, like, like half rot in here and there you can see rot beginning to grow. Uh, so that's what the two of you see downstairs. Anything you wanted to do with any of that info? Is the servant stairwell, is it possible to go down? Uh, yeah, you, you know that, you know that basically there's like a, like a cellar. Uh, so if you peek down there, you notice that there, this was likely once used to store, uh, food and, and supplies and things. Uh, it's very moldy, very damp, very wet down here. While it does seem like there are uh, some goods that are being kept here, you can see that it, this place is kind of being taken over. From what you've observed outside, the swamp has been slowly and slowly swallowing the land, the Henslow land. Uh, and so you can tell, you can feel like a, a moistness and a dampness on your feet when you kind of crunch along the fo floor a bit. You can see little oozes of water. This is not, this place is not in, in, in good shape. Um, there's, it's a very small space, very cramped. Um, I would say looking around, you would be surprised if anyone's even been down here anytime in the last year, two years. Like you don't see anything like recently stored. Um, and there's like old goods that have been grown over mildew, fungus, stuff like that. All right. I'll just, I'll just be in the nearby rooms looking. Okay. And we go back up. We'll say you go up to kitchen you start fixing some tea and stuff like that. And going through the cupboards, you find a handful of very nice teacups, but you're having to kind of blow some dust out of them, wipe some grime out. You find some old, uh, some old, uh, sort of it's like what looks like a, like jars and tins of tea. You smell it. It, it smells stale. Like it's probably not going to have a great deal of taste, but you do find some things here and there. Um, Beverly, what about you? She's going to check out that desk. Okay. Um, so the desk itself, it doesn't look like anyone sits here like regularly and does typing or writing or anything like that. Uh, but one thing that is right there in plain sight, there is a ledger that does seem to track like him. Like, like you can tell, like this is where whoever does or has done like Henslow fortune stuff. You can see like there's some returns and things from the bank kind of tracking their accounts. Um, if you would like, Beverly, you can roll an accounting test. Um, yeah, you can roll an accounting test if you'd like, as you're kind of shifting through some of this paperwork, some of these accounts, some of the ledgers, uh, and seeing if you can deduce exactly what's going on. Take a boost if accounting's not your thing. Uh, She's got I'll like pay. 99 luck. She'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> How much is that? Uh, that's going to be 28. What? 38. 38. <laughs> 38. 38. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll spend the 38. Okay. Um, okay. So what you, I'll say what you definitely notice is that in recent years, uh, the Henslow fortune has been hit really, really badly. Um, and like there does not seem to be any attempts made in the last few years to recoup or restructure any of their investments or recoup any of their losses and doing some basic and some quick math, just looking at what's coming in versus expenses going out. Uh, you're, you're, you're pretty sure that within the next like five years, they're probably going to be completely out of money. Uh, cause there's nothing coming in. Like you see that they don't have like they're like, they do have some, some investments, 
Um, but those investments are not doing well. Some are performing quite poorly, and so they're not bringing mm-hmm. in any any yield. Uh, there's Douglas Henslow. He does not have a job. He's currently in Joy Grove. There's uh, an annual, like there's monthly bills basically. So there's an annual cost for his stay there as well, despite being uh, committed there by the by the state. So well, and they're just paying nothing for Job out. as well, right? Yeah, and so like you don't you don't see anything distinguishing that here, but you can see that the cost you can see the cost of what it is to sort of uh, keep Douglas there. So like you're getting like you're seeing common bills, and one of those is the Joy Grove bill. Okay, uh, upstairs, uh, Marie and Pastor and Shimey, you go upstairs. the The floor is creaky, as you might imagine. Um, you can see where the seams of the wood swells, and some of the uh, some of the different planks are kind of swollen from moisture. Uh, you can see, much like downstairs, there's cracks in the plaster. Again, no one's really been upkeeping the house as well. Uh, there's two elderly folk, people who are in their 70s and 80s on the grounds. These are the only two people living on the grounds other than the dogs. And you can tell that it's in, in, in terrible shape. It doesn't take any real difficulty to find the separate bedrooms. Um, I'll say, Pastor Wood and Shima, you... You manage to gain access to what you think has to be Douglas Hensel's room. Um, first of all, when you when you open it up, there's no one there. There's no one inside, uh, and you can tell that there is a not insignificant mess. It's also very stale uh, when you open it up. Like the air in there is just stale. Uh, the windows have been closed. Um, you can see dust has accrued here and there. Like you get the sense that it almost looks like untouched. Like it, like. Like since he since he last went into the sanitarium, nothing has really changed. Um, the first thing you notice that the ceiling is sagging. Uh, like there's like this big kind of bulbous, bo- you know, it's bowed. Um, you also notice that there is a not unsizable collection of books, Pastor Wood. You're not wrong in that there's one wall that seems to have a, a, a fairly sizable amount of books. Uh, on a bookcase, again, the shelves themselves are sagging ever so slightly. Um, there is a dresser. Uh, Shima, and you'll see that on it and nearby on the ground next to it, there is a shovel. Uh, there is a flashlight, uh, a camera. You can see on the ground, there is this ball of twine. And on the dresser, there is a jar of what looks like ink of some kind and um, like a brush, almost like a like a paintbrush that's been laid uh, across it. Um, just from basic viewing, Shima, you can see that the shovel... And the flashlight, if you're if you're kind of peering at that, are kind of caked with mud. It almost looks like uh, to the point where it's like so old and dried, as so though it's probably on there for the rest of its life. Um, and Pastor, just a quick just a quick glance, you can tell that the books themselves cover all manner of subjects. Like there's anthropology, archaeology, business, uh, finance, art, etc. There's like a, an array of things. There's not like one specific subject matter that seems that Douglas was was interested in. So that's what the two of you see. What do you want to do with that? Well, Miss Oberon, I imagine you're a little better with your letters than I would be. Would you care to take a look? I'll try uh, to find some fresh air if I can. Absolutely. Um, spending some time then on the bookshelf looking specifically for occult related books. Uh, occult related books. Okay. Um, look for the word there. hickory as well if you can. Yes, actually. Thank okay. you. If you are looking specifically for a hickering, you find it quite quickly. In fact, uh, you see that there is the name hickering, Francis J. Hickering. It is on the spine of a book titled The Communion Rites of Victorian Death Cults. Uh, Shima or Pastor, you're, you're, you're in the same room, so you're welcome to do this. Either one of you can can make an occult roll to see if you know sort of anything at all about it, but... Uh, the title does uh, kind of give an indication. <laughs> would love to do that. I have a half a decent occult. I have a five in a cult, so I absolutely <laughs> will be rolling. Go for it. Yeah, if you get lucky. Uh, you can both roll. You can both roll separately. It's fine. Does uh, Call of Cthulhu uh, go to 100 or 99? I always forget. It is 100. It goes to 100. That is a critical. Well, darn. As a fumble. You got a hundred? That's a fumble. I got a hundred. Oh no, I I got a thirty-five under fifty. <laughs> okay. 
So, Pastor, your critical fail, like, I would, considering your reaction to seeing that mouth and hearing what you've heard on the road when you were kind of giving that sort of brief prayer for Marie, it would probably be fair to say that that book, while you don't know exactly what it is, that's Satan. Like there's something about it that just probably immediately like pushes against like whatever kind of dogma that you have adopted in your latter years. And that is like, so like whatever extreme reaction you want to take uh, is probably fair. I slap Uh, it out of her hands. But that, that's what we're looking for. That is the work of the devil. That's the devil. Looking for pastor. It was written by the hand of the serpent. Maybe, maybe, but it was also written by Francis Hickering. (laughs) Hickering. Two things. Some Uh, evil alias. So two things, Shima, you would know that with your occult, that it is a, that there are two different versions of this book. One uh, was, uh, is a very rare, but also, uh, purportedly grotesque edition. Maybe it's even in the Miskatonic Library. Maybe you've peeked at it in some of their special collections. Who knows? Uh, but it's the 1909 edition. That is not what this is. And if it was, Pastor would probably have fainted or something or set the whole place on fire <laughs> because of the things that are described in it. Whereas <laughs> this is more of like a watered down version from 1912. Um, generally, you would know that is essentially concerned with rituals for communion with powerful spirits. And as you might expect, considering the title, ritual sacrifice. Right. Uh, That's I'm the first sorry, thing. Jeff. Could you tell me the the name of the book once again? I have communion. Sure. Of Thank death you for cults. asking. Communion, communion rights of Victorian communion. death cults. Rights of of Victorian death cults. Thank you. That was my medal in high school. <laughs> I had about half of that. <laughs> So that's the first thing, as he says, like, this is written by Satan. You're like, well, actually. Uh, and then the second <laughs> thing is as you slap it down to the ground, Pastor, it flops open. Dust kicks up everywhere. And you see spilling out of it, there is a photograph uh, that um, when you look down just from, you know, from, from standing level, uh, it looks like a photo of the house that you're in, sort of. Like, it, it kind of looks that way. Uh, I do actually have... Um, a photo that I can share with you. Um, and that is what you see as you, um, let's see, let me share it with you all. You get all right. to see a photo. Ooh. You, I, the two of you are smart enough. I would say you haven't actually seen the backside of the house, but I would say the two of you are aware enough to know that it certainly doesn't look like the front, but it definitely looks like that could be the back of the house. Uh, Because you don't see like a front, the front entrance, the stoop, things like that. But you do see otherwise the same kind of plantation style house with the columns. Contextually, it looks like it fits. Sure. Got it. Got it. And so that's what you see sitting on the ground next to the splayed open book. The picture, the photograph, like staring up. Sorry, man. My eyes are real shit. In the bottom right corner, is there a... Like a hole of like planks that have fallen in. Uh, I believe that is meant to be a dock. Okay. Oh, right. Because the water. Right. Right. Sorry. I have shit eyes. (laughs) No, it's fine. Uh, Uh, You're not wrong. My tray, you can also click the pop out button and then zoom in easier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That makes life a lot easier. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's come back to you guys as you figure out what you want to do with all that. And we'll check in with Marie. Uh, Marie, you step into the, do you knock on the door? Uh, or do you do, in fact, um, hear a radio uh, coming through? A very light sounds of what appear to be um, not jazz, unfortunately, but more like very modest kind of classical music playing. Mm-hmm. Uh, very light, very faint coming through the door. Um, and so Marie kind of as she was coming down the hall would have kind of been listening carefully and made sure that she was kind of like 
walking a bit heavy and kind of maybe trying to kind of whistle along to the music kind of as mm-hmm. she came up. So just making sure that she was kind of announcing her presence a bit. Um, and then in, in kind of this kind of like sing songy kind of voice <laughs> would have um, kind of knocked on the door, not in a way to scare. So not necessarily sort of in a, in a banging sort of way, but, but kind of this kind of tapping on the door and then kind of a loud kind of sing songy, uh, Miss, Miss Virginia. Oh, what? Coretta, yes, Miss, is Miss, that you? Uh, no, uh, might, might I, might I come in? Oh, Douglas oh. sent us. Douglas? Oh, Douglas, is that you? Uh, he's he sent us, ma'am, ma'am. May, may I have your permission to enter? Okay, sure, come in, Douglas. Please come give your mother a kiss. <laughs> and so Marie will kind of, I imagine, creak the door open. And what does she see? Uh, you see a older woman. Uh, as I've mentioned, she's definitely in her 80s. Um, you can see that she has a she's kind of she's sitting in her bed. You can see she's kind of propped up. Um, she's got a, a book uh, in her lap that is now kind of been flopped down uh, and the radio is off in the corner. You can see that she's got this modest silver wig on this flowery house coat um, and she's got this sweet smile and on the bed with her. Uh, you can see right next, like right where she might rest her right arm is a cat, uh, as well, uh, who like, she's just sort of very like faintly petting. Oh, you are not Douglas. Oh, no, no, Miss, Miss Virginia. I'm so sorry. We we did uh, get just meet with Douglas though. And, and he did say that we could, uh, come over oh, and have a cat. Douglas. You're a friend of Dougie. I've just made his acquaintance was so delighted to make his acquaintance. Oh, well, well, come in, come in. Oh, have a seat. Oh, I'm afraid I don't. Oh, goodness. And she's trying to get up, but you can see that she's struggling. Oh, no, no, no. You're, 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 you're fine. Um, ma'am, it's, uh, my, my name's, uh, May. V- very nice to meet you, Miss Virginia. Oh, oh, very nice to meet you, May. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, welcome to my home. I, I suppose if you're here, that meant that you got approval from Carruthers, that man. Where is he? And you can see she's kind of he, lifting up and she's got a his window. Cottage. Oh, of course he is. Listening to his sermons or his baseball. It's always one of the two with that old man. Oh. Well, if he's short on sermons, I actually have a pastor here with me. <laughs> Perhaps he could uh, bring him up, up to speed with another one. Do Oh, well, how very lovely. How very lovely indeed. Oh, well. How how is my Douglas? Is he doing well? He he did appear to be doing well. We we just uh, came from a visit with him. He was uh, was sharing some stories with us, and uh, he did uh, did seem seem to be doing well. Oh well, that makes me very happy to hear. I'm so I'm so delighted. It's been some time since I've been able to see him. Oh. Oh, and you look, she gets really confused. I thought, how was it last week? No, no, it was, was it a year? Oh, what month is it? It's here? okay. It, it, it's okay. It, 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 it's fine. It's, it's, it's not a problem. Can, can I get you a, a tea or anything while we, while we chat? At that point, you hear like the whistling of the teapot and we cut down to the kitchen where Patrick Price has been making tea. Uh, Patrick, you have some tea, uh, you've made, you've steeped it, etc. Um, what do you want to do, Patrick? I'm going to bring it to the others. Got to share this fine. Just <laughs> bring it around. You've got this like serving plate that hasn't been used in decades. Hand one over to Beverly, go creeping up. You peek into the the bedroom where Pastor uh, Pastor Wood and Shima are arguing, and they're staring down at a book on the ground and a photograph. What are you like? Burst! I've in? got a Bible held out and <laughs> towards the book. <laughs> I was plaintively like trying to calm calm down, <laughs> and for a split uh, second, my anger fades. Why is that tea warm? Tea should have ice. It should be sweet. Well, 
It's the best I could find. Time will take this opportunity to <laughs> bend down and I hastily pick up the book and the photo. Be like, the the book must be in the back of the house somewhere. His uh, journal must be in the back of the house somewhere. So two things then upon picking it up. Patrick's in the room. Patrick, you can confirm as the photograph is up. You have snuck around the back of the house. You can confirm. And if Shima points out the the planks and stuff, Patrick, you think I would say because you've been back here because you snuck around. Oh, no, it's not a it's not a dock or anything. But you remember there being like this, like a broken down fence because in the back there is a cemetery uh, that's being swallowed up and there's like a fence around it. And those look like little spokes or. Uh, like a, of the of the fence itself that it was splayed and kind of being lost to time and, and wear and hasn't really been up. That's probably what that is. The second thing is that as you pick up the photograph, you notice that there is actually something written on the back. Uh, and so I will Amazing. share that nice. with you as well. So you see two dash Grant, three dash John and Mary, four dash Zachariah and Millicent, five dash back to one, along with a stain. Looks like a like a teacup stain. Mm. And that's what well, you see as Patrick is handing over this the tea. Would you look at that? It shows that does this make any sense to any of you? Ah, so this is one of those scriptures. Oh, Have you not read John the Bible? And Mary in the Bible. There is no book of Grant. <laughs> what ah, about Millicent? Maybe it's a new one. There's a bunch of new books at the University Library. That blasphemer. <laughs> <laughs> Lord forgive her. She knows not what she says. Because there's no book of Grant. Well, you so. keep searching. <laughs> so, Patrick. You step out of the room, leaving the two of them to whatever they're doing. You gently rap on the door where you can hear voices. You can hear Marie's voice plus an old woman's voice. You can hear the sound of very low classical music. And you step inside and you see there is Marie speaking uh, with what you would presume is Virginia Henslow. Um, is she an uh, older woman in her 80s? She's got the cat that she's sort of petting. One of the windows is open. You can feel like a, this this sort of warm, uh, thick breeze coming in from it. Uh, and you can see kind of out to the to the property through the, through the window. And, oh, oh, hello there, young man. Are you a friend of my Douglas as well? Well, yes, I've just met him. I prepared some tea for you. I am Patrick. No. Oh. Patrick, that's so very kind of you. Come, come here. Come. And she like reaches up her hand. Just set it right here. And is shaking and gnarled. You can tell that she's she's uh, she's she's of advanced age. And she just kind of very gently um, pats the kind of nightstand next to her. Uh, where you can see there's like a hand. There's like a like a like a handkerchief and like another teacup there. And it looks like some some sort of stale bread or toast that she might have been snacking on at some point. Um when you walk past and set it down, the cat, its head comes up and sort of stirs and just, and it kind of looks over towards Marie. And then she just kind of reaches down, sort of pets. Oh, quiet now, Virgil. He's very protective. You'll see he's such a sweetheart. Look at him. Oh, oh Virgil. Oh, what, might, might I? Is, is it okay? And Marie kind of reaches her hand out to kind of ask permission to. And so Virgil will like lift its head forward, recoil, lift it back more gently, and then lower it and kind of like give access to the, uh, give access to the top of the head. While that's happening, there's like a, Patrick, you set the, the tea down. It like rattles a little bit and Marie, like the cat, like recoils and snatches out at you. But you're, you have a cat. You're used to, you're used to their quickness. And you manage to kind of pull your hand away just before that they try to almost like snip at you a little bit, much the way the dog kind of snipped at uh, Shima yesterday or the day before. Uh, oh, you stop it now. You'll be nice to our guests. Oh, I'm so sorry. He's very protective. You'll see. 
Oh, oh, it uh, while this with... conversation is happening, can Charmin actually go downstairs with the photograph to Dr. Key and basically just say, I tend to scare old women, so maybe you can take this photograph in with you and uh, maybe some one of you can ask her if these names mean anything to, to her, to the family. Uh, that kind of thing. So basically asking Doc to go into the room while everybody else is, is there. Um, uh, I'm not great with speaking with people. Um, there has to be some sort of book regarding their genealogy. Uh, so she, cause while Patrick was bringing up the tea, that would be kind of like the next thing Beverly's looking for in like the downstairs living space is other books like related to the family. Uh, no, you actually don't find anything like that necessarily. Um, there's no, you see like a, like a photo, not a photograph, maybe actually maybe a photograph and maybe a painting or two on the wall of like this person or that person. Uh, but if you're looking for like, any sort of like written annals or something like that. No, you don't, you don't find anything like that. But you do see like a crooked photo here, a crooked photo there, all of it kind of interspersed on some walls between um, like what actually looks like animal heads, like hunt, like, you know, kind of hunting, um, I guess they've been sort of mounted here and there. Um, but no, you don't really notice anything to suggest, um, I guess some sort of like history of the, of the family anywhere that you can find. Uh, again, the place is very messy and you can tell it hasn't, they haven't hosted, they have, it's been decades probably since they've any done, on, done any kind of proper like redecorating and hosting and it all feels kind of a mess right now. Okay. Okay. So while Maybe the two of you are, are can speak to her, sorry. I'm going to, I'm going to go back up. Cause like that, that conversation, like you guys are down here looking for it. And so that conversation is continuing. So we're going to come back up and like, so the, the pastor, you're by yourself, uh, in the bedroom, uh, and Erin, uh, in Douglas's room, but then Marie and Patrick, you are both in the room with, with Miss Henslow. And she's just like, and so she's like chiding the cat. I'm so very psych. It's very ornery, but that's very kind of you to bring the tea. It's uh, very kind. Uh, 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 might I ask why? Uh, why are you here exactly? I don't mean to be rude, but uh, yes. Have you uh, ever heard uh, Douglas speak of the Winstons? Oh well, let me see. Um, <clears throat> oh yes. Um, well, something very. Uh, Hmm. That's not a name I care to talk about too much, but I will say this. Something happened, my boy, while he was um, away on business with a with a Mr. Walter Winston. I remember that. It was years ago. Four? Maybe five? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I, my memory isn't quite what it used to be. No, but no, no worries. It was t 24 is what we've heard. If you say so, this is 32, right? Yeah, 32. Uh, this is 36. Thir 36. 36. That's what I said. I said 36. Yes. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes. Now, Winston, yes, he, uh, he and my boy had business. Apparently, he took my boy away from me, and they traveled here and there, and poor Douglas, he was, well, he was attacked by... My hedonists and folks of loose morals. And then he merely defended himself. I don't care what the uh, what the doctors say, but <laughs> whatever it was that he saw out in California, oh well, it was too terrible for him to tell his poor mother. Drove him to the hospital. It's Probably quite, for the rest quite, of his days now. Quite a sad, quite a sad tale. Yeah, I suppose it is. But you say he's doing better. Yes, you spoke with him. Yeah, yes, he he seemed uh, quite quite clear of mind. Uh, we we are here uh, attempting to to d discover a, a bit more about what may have happened and try to 
prevent such things from befalling other sons. Oh, well, that's very, very noble of you, my dear. Very noble of you, kind young man who brought me tea. Um, but I'm not sure what I can do to help you other than wish you, wish you well. And, uh, yes, yes, wish you well. Well, we we thank you for for your you know for permission as, as well. We we were just wondering if there is anything that you 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 knew perhaps uh, last time um, Mister Henslow was here. Uh, he he indicated that he might have left something here. He left do, all do you... his things here. I I told Carruthers. You leave my boy's room alone. Just shut the door and the windows, so, uh, and that's it. Leave it the way it was, and that's what happened. That was, was it 32? We said, yes, back in 32, yes. Sure, sure, sure. Y- yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you, do you re- recall him? Um, was he a, was he a boy that liked to, uh, kind of hide things around, you know, put, put things in a stump of a tree somewhere or anything like that. As a boy, when he was a boy, he was a delightful boy. Never did anything look so curious. He read, loved to read. Oh, he had a mind for it. So curious. No, but, but when he was last here, well, he spent most of his time up in his study down the hall. Uh, Post time with his poor mother, and he was oh, and he was drawing and sketching. Oh, he was so so creative. He was sometimes sketching. He would, okay, he would yell and he would holler, and uh, it got that I got that I was afraid of my own son. Some of the things that came out of his mouth so very frightening. It was so, oh oh, and then he'd have have wounds on him like cuts and, and bruises that he couldn't explain, and then he took to wandering the property near dark, and, well, poking around on the grounds with his shovel and his camera and that silly ball of twine of his. More than once, Virgil wanted to take that twine and run off and play with it, and I said, no, Virgil, leave it alone. That is, that's Dougie's. You have your own toy. Ball of twine, you say, out, out on the property with a shovel? Who knows what gets into the minds of young men? No offense, Mr. What was your name again? Mr. Price. Yes, yes. This is delicious tea. She takes a sip, winces, and then puts it back down. It's very, very delicious. Why, thank you. I make tea all the time. I'm going to open a window, maybe pick up some things, dust some cabinets. Oh, that's all. So very kind of you, young kind man. Kind of just snoop so around while doing it. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's cut back at that point then to Pastor Wood. Uh, you've been left alone. Uh, I think Shima took the book and the photo downstairs. She's with Dr. Key. Um, but Pastor Wood, you're all by yourself in this room. Is there anything else that you wanted to do in here? There are several things I want to do. First of all, I want to open a window so we can get rid of that stale air. And you get a breeze, a warm breeze. It's a, it's a wet breeze too. You can, you can feel rain. It's coming. Like it's, it's on, like you're on the verge of it, uh, but not quite. Um, It's also very dark outside despite the time of day. It's probably three o'clock or so, four o'clock, something like that. Um, So what would you like to do? My next a uh, step would be to probably drag one of the end tables or a chair towards the center of the room, take a look at that sagging ceiling. I'll pull out a pocket knife and uh, cut a small hole in there. Uh, sure. Um, and it cuts through extremely easily. Um, and you can see like the, the, it starts to just peel away. Uh, and you can see flakes, uh, like these moist flakes fall down. There's what looks to be like, severe water damage um it's uh as if you like cut away a piece and sort of reach up into the attic you can just feel like moisture and you when you pull your hand out it's kind of coated in little flakes of like wood that has rotted bits of uh like mildew and such it's it's just in terrible terrible shape like it likely the the ceiling will probably collapse sometime soon 
And while I'm rearranging furniture, I suppose I might as well rearrange the rest of the room. I'll try to pull out the bookshelf a little bit, pull away the bed. Basically, I'm looking for any sort of uh, those strange letters and symbols that we saw in the asylum, seeing if Henslow would have carved any in his own room. Uh, you you look around, um, and you you do see some faded symbols. Um, I think Beverly and Shimo were like identifying them as like various cultures. Like there's nothing individually, but you do see like some sort of very faded marks here and there, uh, kind of behind, behind the, like you said, behind the dresser. Um, when you look at them, nothing strange happens and they're barely, they're very faint. Like they've, you know, it's been years. Um, he was last here in 1932. So it's been four years since he's been here, but they've faded away fairly considerably. As a matter of principle, I'm going to start uh, cutting them away and uh, disfiguring them as best as possible. Okay. All right, anything else you wanted to do? Uh, nothing too specific. Just searching for anything that might catch my eye. Just a cursory look of anything that might be like a private journal or notes. Something more personal rather than just stacks yeah. of books. That's the thing. Interestingly enough, you don't find anything like that in here which is sort of surprising in some ways, especially if this does, you don't know this for sure because you're not in the other conversation, but you can get, you definitely get the sense that this was almost sealed up like a tomb and like no one's really gone in here. You don't even see any footprints on the floor. Like you don't see anything on the dust, but now you do between you and Chima and Patrick kind of coming and going. Like you can see the dust is sort of shifted around here and there, but you don't find anything like that. Um, you see there's plenty of books again tons of topics some of them probably are don't sit well with you others um no they just seem like a perfectly curious uh curious man variety of topics many of them academic um finances stuff like that um you see the only other kind of personal items are like i listed before like there's a camera um you can see there's definitely jar of like jar of ink crusted on top. Like it's like, it's dried. Uh, and then the, then that there is like a, a paintbrush as well, but you can tell that that thing is like the paint has dried so heavily on the tip that it's never going to be useful again. Um, and then what color was the paint? Uh, it looks like kind of like a purplish blue kind of color. Would there be anything else around that looks purplish blue? Um, give me a spot hidden. I can do that. I was about to uh, put that, that question a, in chat. What color is the paint? Uh, 41 under 75. One thing you notice, in fact, as you're looking around, when you look down at that ball of twine, you see that there are little marks here and there and some of the overlapping, because it's, ball, it's balled up right now. You can you can see in the in this sort of compacted state of that ball of twine, there are these little bluish ink marks here and there uh, on various strands. As if the twine was used for measuring something at one point. That's not a bad conclusion. Yeah. I'll take the twine. I'll take the camera. And uh, I'll do one more quick look around. This time I would be tapping on different panels, things like that, seeing if a uh, paranoid man might have tried to hide something with a secret drawer or something like that. Sure. Uh, carrying over your spot hidden and just the physical movement of stuff around you don't find any like hidden caches anywhere in the room. Um, there's plenty of spaces for them. There's plenty of floorboards that are kind of coming loose, uh, sections of the wall, some wall paneling that could easily have been pried open. They could have been used as a hiding spot. Nothing like that. Very uh, well then. Uh, with, I'll grab those few items and then I'll seal up the room, being okay. respectful, closing the window again, closing the doors tight. We'll cut then down to Shima and Beverly who have been looking around without success for uh, some sort of reference, some sort of like like annals and, and sort of history, like a, like a book detailing the history of the family. I'll tell you what, though. How about the two of you? Um, you can roll spot hiddens if you like. Uh, as you're moving about un, unfettered. No one's, no one's bothering you down here. It's a suggestion in chat to look for a family Bible that might have like a genealogy in the front of it or something. That's what that's, I'm, I'm was presuming. That's what Ashley was looking for, but no, yeah. you don't. You actually don't notice that down here. 
Oof. That's a okay. fail. Right. So success for me, seven under 70. Shima, you do notice that as the two of you are shifting around looking on shelves for this or that, um, you do notice that some of the photos and the portraits, some of them are actually labeled. Um, and so that you can see kind of like faint references either like in the bottom right or the bottom left or on the frame itself or if you pull like a photo a frame photo off the wall uh, you do see um, names and references to like other members of the the Henslow family like one of the photos you see is of uh, of David Henslow who is Doug you know is Douglas's father um, so you definitely see that you notice uh, a name or two uh, like a James and a Mildred uh, that seems to be this painting, um, maybe like Civil War era. Uh, you can see that looks to be like a, a couple. Um, you see like a, a, a John and Mary faded, but they look like it, it definitely looks like um, um, like a, like an early photograph, um, like a daguerreotype, you know, kind of. It's not, it doesn't, it like it, like they were sitting still for an extremely long period of time for it to go off that kind of deal. So like late 19th, early 20th century kind of deal. Um, but they don't reference then. So like John and Mary Cokeridge uh, is the name. So you do see a couple of names and Shima, I would say that as you're going through and finding a few of these, some of them are faded away or scraped out or here or there, or some aren't even, um, some aren't even labeled. You do notice names that correspond to those written on the back of the photograph. You see Zachariah and Millicent. You, could, you definitely see that. Um, you see John and Mary, like I've already mentioned, that kind of thing. Uh, and you uh, and you certainly notice um, a Grant Henslow who who died. Like you can you can tell that there's like a note um, scribble on the back. Seems to have served like he's like in a uniform, like a World War One uniform. Uh, and you get the sense that maybe he died in World War One. I'm gonna call Dr. Key over first and point all of this out. Um, and then kind of uh, ask if if we should be, there doesn't seem to be anything about the genealogy here, but old families like this, there's a cemetery in the back and there was a shovel upstairs that was caked in mud. Oh. Uh, would you mind grabbing the shovel and we'll meet no, out back? No, no, I, I, you should not be shoveling in such a nice Oh, way. I have before, uh, but this is fascinating. I wonder what we could find. I, I'll do the shoveling. <laughs> and she runs upstairs to get the shovel and, and be helpful. Sure. Well, so Beverly you, is the most excited that you guys have <laughs> ever seen her. The fact that we're going to be like digging and searching for something like stuff belongs in the museum. Um, yes, exactly. <laughs> What's that All right, from? Ezreal. Ezreal. Uh, 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 no, it's not. It's from Indiana Jones. <laughs> but he also says it. Because he's referencing Indiana Jones. I haven't seen it. Oh, goodness. I thought it was from National Not Treasure. Neither have I, Ashley. <laughs> Damn it, Steven. All right. Um, we'll say that, Shima, you you run into Pastor Wood as he's coming out. Um, and we'll check back in with Marie and Patrick. You're in the room. Uh, Patrick, you've tidied up. Um, you said you were kind of poking around and looking for things. Is there something in particular you were looking for? Or is Maybe there's something hidden, wasn't really seen. You can roll a spot hidden if you like. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fine. 49. I'll spend the 14. Okay. Nice. Um, the only thing... Well, there's two things I would say you notice. You notice that there are the remains of a mouse uh, kind of tucked underneath her bed here and there. Uh, relatively fresh kill. Uh, and then secondly, you do notice very lightly carved into some of the molding around this room, this chair molding that goes along roughly the center uh, of the wall. You see some like strange, like image, like, like little carvings. They don't look like letters. They just look like little drawings and runes and kind of graphics and things, little, little things that barely, very lightly carved into them. 
I'll leave the rat there. And I'll speak to mother again. Ask her if it's Douglas the only child. Oh, yes, yes, Douglas. Unfortunately, David and I couldn't, didn't have any time for more. Just, just Douglas. And what of Mr. Henslow? Oh, well, he died uh, some time ago. He got, got sick, he did, unfortunately. Nothing to do with his heart. Just His ticker stopped working, I believe. How long have you been here? You've always been here. Oh, yes, this is a... This is a Henslow estate. We've been here for, oh, for a oh, better part of 150, maybe 200 years. It's the family, the family home. We used to sprawl wide and far. We used to have different families and folk working the lands and the fields. But not anymore. Now it's just, just old Carruthers and me and... And Virgil, and Carruthers, mongrel mutts, and when we're fortunate, old Douglas as well. One of one of those mutts uh, bit one of my companions. I'm not the surprised. They're terrifying. They're worse than the alligators. They are. I, I mean, I, I I must say, if I if I were to have some dogs that were guarding my home, I would not mind it to be those dogs. They uh, take their jobs quite seriously. Well, that's what Carruthers says, but I've told him if they hurt one hair on Virgil's head, well, there'd be hell to pay. <laughs> it it does appear to me that Virgil can uh, quite take care of himself. It would appear. Well, yes, he's quite capable hunter. He is. Brings me all sorts of gifts, he does. Don't you? Don't you, Virgil? Just kind of like head moves a little bit just to find the right spot. Mm. Now, I, I, I don't mean to be rude, but I'm getting very tired. I'm not used to such lengthy conversations. Is there, is there something more I could do for you? I, I feel an urge to sh- shut my eyes for a little while, if that's all right. Oh, we just came by to offer Douglas's love to you. Oh, well, that's so very kind of you, Mr. Price. Uh, if you see my, my boy again, please extend it in return. That's so very kind. So very kind. And she kind of reaches out her hand, kind of shaking it towards you, Patrick. I'll offer mine. Okay, and she just takes it and kind of grabs it and sort of thinks, so very kind, and don't think I didn't notice what you were doing around here. Very kind. This place has not looked so well, and I'm terribly embarrassed. I should have, if I would have known we had company, I would have, yeah, well, thank you, nonetheless. Well, let you drift. Yes, th- thank you. Thank you, my dear, so much for for sharing some stories with us and a little bit of your time. Of course, of course, May, of course. If you need anything, please speak with Carruthers. I'm sure he could sort you out if there's something you need. Yes, yes. Uh, He he, uh, made sure that we did not gain entry until we had your son's permission. Uh, I I did just want to let you know, though, that um, we we may not leave just right away. Uh, We may kind of be poking around a little bit. So if you hear something outside, don't, don't, don't worry. It's just us. Well, thank you for the warning. Try not to break anything, of course. Yes, absolutely. And and, and Marie will kind of extend her hand and then also see if she can give uh, Virgil one last little uh, scritch. And Virgil will. Well, Virgil will. We'll take this, to, we'll take the little the pet from you, but you can tell, like, you can kind of feel the tension. And so as a cat owner yourself, you kind of know, eh, I, I don't want mm-hmm. to indulge any further. And you kind of pull the hand away. And we'll say... Um, through the wonderful timing, you all leave uh, Mother Henslow's room at just the same time when Shima comes up the stairs, Pastor comes out of Douglas's room, and the four of you are on the upper floor landing, all staring at each other. Pastor has a shovel and a camera and a ball of twine in his hands, and Shima might have the photograph or the book in her hands and stuff like that, and it, Patrick is carrying like a a, a mouse carcass and various other things to toss out <laughs> and some empty teacups. I'll turn it oh, back over. To you. What's next? I, I was just going to come and get those. Well, we, it's a festivist uh, miracle. We, 
<laughs> we found uh, photographs of uh, these people down downstairs, and we think they may be buried in the back, and perhaps that will lead us to uh, Doug's journal. And you, Mr. Price, are you planning on burying that dead rat? Yeah, I'll toss it out in the back. Well, it it we we were told that uh, the last time Douglas was home, he had spent time outside uh, quite a bit with uh, the twine and the shovel. And I take it we're venturing outside now. It appears so. Excellent. Shine, okay. Miss Obron, I I do wish you would carry that book a bit more carefully. That is an artifact of evil. Oh, yes, that, that, that is a good idea. And she tucks it into her voice friend to make sure she doesn't lose it. <laughs> Thank you, okay. Pastor. That's, a, that's an excellent day. Yeah. <laughs> he kind of cringes at seeing it tucked into the waistband. <laughs> but he's not going to push it. <laughs> um, you descend the stairs. You meet up with Beverly. And then you all head outside, right? Is that what you said? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so between what you've what Patrick saw before and being able to kind of conclude that those sort of wooden planks in the corner you, and, and just seeing the rear of the of the house, uh, you all move around to the back or maybe you just go out the back door through the kitchen by the servant stairs and everything like that. And you step outside the, the back screen door is ajar, kind of not quite sitting properly. And, and when you step down moist ground, um, storm clouds are even closer and closer now. Uh, you hear the vague, the vague sound of the radio from her room upstairs, but also you hear like a competing radio of what sounds just like a, like a, some sort of like the sound of a ball being hit and someone speaking a little bit about uh, like giving a call of a baseball game. But you notice that at the rear of the of the grounds, there is a cemetery and it is surrounded by a fence that is suffering significantly. There is an open entrance into it. Like you would think there was likely a gate there at some point that probably led in, but it doesn't appear that it survived or if it has, maybe it's been like buried by some of the uh, by some of the dirt. But the ground is sloping down and away from the plantation house itself into what is effectively the swamp's edge. And so Patrick, when you were sneaking around the last time you were here, you recall that one whole side of the property did not have a wall any further because it was essentially consumed by the swamp. And you can see that these, this cemetery just seems to kind of fall down the slope. Like it's just being eaten away. Um, there are tombstones, a uh, couple dozen, jutting out from weeds and reeds here and there. Some have been fully encompassed by uh, the the swamps themselves, and you can just see them sticking above the sludge. Others are a little bit further uh, up the hill. You can see there's tall stone crosses past her. You can see there's a weeping angel uh, at one point. Um, and this is what you see. What do you all want to do? I, I must ask, are we just blindly digging out here do we have any direction uh the whole way here i think uh shama has explained to everybody sort of start to finish her, her findings and a very sort of like student giving a book word kind of tone <laughs> of like i went to the bedroom past what suggested we look for this name as an author of found this book Turns out it's actually a watered down version of this other book, uh, and then et cetera. And the names, uh, seeing the pictures, assuming there might be a family estate back here. So, looking for these names specifically. So oh, I see. With, with the twine and oh, yes. oh, this this is wonderful. So it we gave can, us a little treasure. We can map. do two, three, and four relatively easily, and maybe the twine will help us. Find five in one. Well, I certainly hope so. Uh, Pastor Wood, do you need help? You've got shovel and twine and a camera. And can I take the twine off your hands? Very well. 
Uh, I'll go ahead and hand over the twine and the shovel to whoever wants it. Sure. Uh, I'll take the shovel. I I'm gonna be. Yeah, I'm very actively doing the shoveling. <laughs> sure. Be- before Wood would get too far helping with that, though, he would want to get the picture from Shima and just compare like the image of the picture to the back of the house now, uh, and see if he can tell how long it's been since that picture was taken or anything like that. Uh, it certainly seems as there there's been some additional wear. Uh, since this picture was taken, not you can you can tell the picture itself. The house wasn't in great shape to begin with, so it wasn't that long ago. Um, considering that you know that the last time Douglas Henslow was out of Dry Grow Sanitarium was around 1932, uh, you would presume that that it might be about four years old or so. Um, while you're doing this, if you want, you can make a roll. Um, if you have photography, that would be the ideal role. But if you don't have photography, that's fine. You can do. Um, I do not. I'll give you like you could do like a um, a spot hidden, but I would want a hard a hard success on it if you did it. Um, what else? I'm trying to think if there's anything else that might work. That's probably it. Uh, yeah, that's one of my best skills anyway. So. Give, yeah, give it a roll. I, I just want a hard success. And you can you, know, you can always use luck to increase the degree uh, of success as well. 26 under 75. So that is oh, a perfect. hard success. Nice. You're looking, you're moving around. Eventually, uh, Pastor Wood, well, I'm assuming everyone's kind of spread out and kind of look. Is it everyone spread out and looking around? Is, is, that, is that fair? Yeah, trying to read the tombstones. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, if that's the case, let me bring you all to this as you start to notice that many of the tombstones are unfortunately illegible like they've worn over time however uh many still have names that are bearing on them uh so i've brought you over to a kind of a layout uh in foundry there of the various tombstones and such and you can see there's a keel on the right hand side that has various names now pastor while everyone's spread out looking around here and there and you're holding up the photo, kind of moving around here and there, looking at the back of the house now, looking at the photo, you find yourself moving. And eventually, when you look down, you you sort of realize like you are literally standing on or, or immediately next to the grave of Douglas's father, David Henslow. Apologies, sir. Uh, would that be uh, David and Virginia? Okay, I see where that is. Yeah, Virginia obviously would be a plot as she's up in the bedroom right, right now. Um, uh, I would point that out to probably Shima, who's seemed the most enthusiastic about all this. It appears that this photograph was taken from this very spot. That is incredible that uh, I know most of these look ineligible, but thankfully the ones that we can read, all of the names appear to be on there. And Ron Henslow, Zach Ryan Innocent, and John Mary Cooperage. This would then likely be spot number one where he started. That is an excellent observation. Another observation is that whoever built that house should be shot. That carpenter can't make a right angle for the life of him. Look at those <laughs> windows. They're all they're all uneven. That that window's a foot higher than the other one. The door is two feet to the left. How do you know all this? Well, look at it. You can see that it's all off. I, I don't know what you all are, are talking about over there, but I, I think I might have the second one. Master Wood walks back up to the two. house and starts pointing this door and then pointing up to the window and showing like how far <laughs> off they are. Well, Marie, you're calling out, you know where the second one is. What is it you're doing, Marie? Uh, so <laughs> so the the um there was a number two on the back of the photo that had the name Grant. Um and there is um kind of in the 
northern middle section of the uh, the graveyard, uh, there is a Grant Henslow 1880 to 1917. Yeah, so I eight. imagine that is the second one. Number eight corresponds yes. to that one. So Marie sort of stands in sort of like this I need paper. spot number two. <laughs> yeah, no, number 13 and number 20 are the, uh, uh, sorry, number 13 and number 15 are the other two. Yeah, 15 is three and 13 is four. Yeah. yeah. Marie, toss the twine over here. I'm standing at the next one. And number five is back to one, which um, was David... In Virginia is so what's number six. Number six. Which makes it seem that number seven is the plot we want. Seven, yeah. At, at worst, seven, 13, or seven, or 14. And that, you know, let's start with seven, see what we find. If we need to take a second, then. Well, can we match it up with the notches on the twine? That's what I was hoping. That's a. Good idea. Okay, so or is I there think, any paint here? Uh, so Patrick had called out. He wanted the twine. Did anyone pass the twine over to him? Yeah. So so Marie was Marie was standing in uh, spot number two, and so then uh, she threw the twine over to uh, Mr. Price at uh, spot number three, also known as fifteen. All right. So so Patrick, if you're looking at the twine, um. You notice as you start to, maybe even as it's thrown, it kind of unravels a little bit. You notice that there are various blue ink marks uh, in these little clusters. That's basically like a foot or more apart with each of those clusters kind of separated by several feet of very clean twine as you start to unravel it. Each, Ooh. like basically each stretch of clean twine is marked by what looks like a bit of very tightly knotted twine. Uh, well past like the halfway point between those ink stains. Uh, so uh, basically, as you start to look at it and you're starting to unspool it a little bit while everyone's kind of poking around, um, it basically divides the twine either into like five clusters of ink marks or basically four lengths of clean twine, each marked by effectively a knot. Um, and then Marie, you had asked about... Um, you had mentioned like looking for like kind of ink blots or something like that. Uh, so if you if you look around the cemetery, um, yeah, you definitely notice that there are some like stains um, here and there. Some of the headstones, especially the ones that are listed on the back of that photo, are marked with that kind of bluish purple ink. Yeah, you definitely do see that. Uh, so Patrick, like as you're un un unfurling it, you're kind of just sort of pulling it out and kind of looking and seeing that kind of pattern. Okay, so I, I think we've I think we've got it. Uh, so Marie kind of passes to, to Patrick. Uh, all right, so who's who is at uh, who's at thirteen? Patrick, you're at fifteen. Uh, Doctor Key, are you at thirteen? So we're kind of passing the twine around. Uh, Pastor Wood, are you are you done? Are you done with your architecture lesson? I, I think we're 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 about to finish this. If you can get back to uh... <laughs> well, my focus was more on the carpentry than the architecture, but y yes, I'm that's, more that's... than willing to help. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Pastor. So, uh, Sham is kind of standing by with the shovel, like waiting to sort of be told where to start digging and kind of leaving the markers and the measuring up to the four of you. So, I think at this point, we've marked off the four kind of that make, makes the square, yeah, with the twine, yeah, which leaves two gravestones in the middle. Uh, an ineligible and a James and Mildred. Patrick, what are you going to say? It looked like you're about to say something. Um, yeah, I was asking, what did we decide what was one? Uh, David and Virginia Henslow, which is number six. Okay. Does that line up with the twine that we have, or does the twine actually go back all the way to the first one? 
All right. So uh, if you start it, Dave, as I heard someone say you were like wrapping some of the twine. Yeah. So when you start to tie the twine tightly around David and Virginia, their, their, their headstone or tombstone, um, and then you kind of run it over towards two, which is, which would be Grant. And then you kind of tie it around. You start to notice that like the ink marks on the twine are actually corresponding to the ink marks on the tombstones. Okay, cool. And then like, it makes the, like the twine very, very taut, almost like you can kind of pluck it, you know, like a, like a string. And then you kind of go through the next one. You run the twine to the John and Mary Cokeridge headstone. And then you bring it to the next one to Zachariah and Millicent's. And then you go back to one, as the photograph says. And each time you do this, you tie it around one of the headstones until the, 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 the twine is basically taut. And it creates this relatively like imperfect square that's kind of partitioned off by the twine itself. And there's like a knot in each length of, uh, of like the taut twine. And so... It basically creates this kind of lopsided grid. Um, so you have what effectively amounts to like a, like a square of sorts, like with the, and you can see that there's these knots in each one of those lines. So there's like a, a, a knot hanging out on the, on the line between one and two. There's a knot hanging like somewhere in the middle of that taut line between two and three. And there's same thing, a knot in the middle of that, sh that string of twine between three and four and the same thing between one and four. If anybody wants, um, you can make like a no roll or an idea roll right now. You can give me like an int roll right now. Uh, if you want to sort of, yeah, I, I, cause I, I have a, an intuition as a player, but I'd love to get there as a character. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. Uh, what was the rule you asked for? Int, just straight int. Uh, an int would be five. Int times five. So if you click it on the sheet or just roll it and multiply your int score times five, and that's your target. You said anyone can do this? Anyone could do it. Yeah. Like if you guys, if you guys are struggling to sort of picture it. Well, because this kind of looks like an archaeology uh, like dig site, right? Like marked off. Uh, it sort of looks like it looks like a, a like a like a marking grid. Yeah, it does yeah, have that kind like, of feel to it. And he did have archaeology and anthropology books on his shelf. So he is uh, not. Sorry, forty five hundred sixty. Sorry to interrupt. No, you're good. Um, so Shima, it occurs to you that on each like of this kind of lopsided square that is made by these taut strings, the ink on the ink on like the ink markings on the on the string matches the ink marking on the tomb, but it does leave each side of this square effectively has a knot. Yeah, and. You notice that if you basically kind of draw a line between each of the knots, it kind of pinpoints a very precise spot in the middle of these graves, not in a Hell grave yes, itself. Yes, it does. <laughs> but in the middle, of, yeah. So it's like you, you're not digging into someone's grave; you're actually digging into this sort of interstitial spot between a series of these graves. Oh, amazing. Okay, that makes me feel so much better in character because I was really like <laughs> passwords can be so mad about us desecrating game graves. <laughs> I mean, I'm such a good like visual of this in my head of like all of us like standing next to mm -hmm. one and Shima is just like excitedly yeah. like noticing the knots and like putting it all together in the middle. Someone's getting ready to dig into like the you know David's plot like well I guess we'll start here with one. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine we all get lined up with the the knots, and then we all just walk into the center. And oh yeah! Oh, oh yeah! Totally. I love that. All right. Okay. Cool. So, yeah, I I was hoping that that's what it was. Was that there was a um yeah a point that was being shown by the knots. And you're and you're, I mean that makes sense. And so you have it sort of squared off, and like you look at the the color of the mud on the shovel. You look at the color of the mud kind of around the cemetery, like the coloring kind of this like uh, sort of, sort of orangey brown um, definitely matches up as well. Uh, obviously it's been four years. So it, like the doesn't look like it's been recently disturbed, but you can definitely mark off a spot, at least in your minds. So uh, who does the digging? Oh, Shami definitely. 
I, I would like to think that Dr. Key tries to get into the day and say, no, your suit is far too nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shima, you get the shovel. You've got your spot. Quite literally, as you press the shovel into the ground, right where the mark is, the thunder clouds, like those, the thunderstorm clouds in the distance that have been encroaching and encroaching, literally a crackle of thunder and you see a rupture of lightning across the sky right as you press in and a little drizzle of rain begins to fall and all around you the you see the ground is beginning to like wet a bit in some ways it's making it easier in some ways those of you in nice clothes you're feeling your bodies like your clothes kind of begin to soak and soak it's getting very dark too as the storm clouds are starting to roll overhead anybody near the back of the cemetery you can see like the the raindrops like beginning to grow in number in the swamp water you can see there's some sloshing around here and there as like an alligator or two starts to move around you see like little bugs and frogs and stuff kind of hop from this spot to the next and over the course of a not i mean it probably takes you the better part of we'll say um an hour not quite an hour to kind of push through. Um, by the time you get to the end of it, it's like the drizzle has become pretty steady. The dark thunder clouds have fully immersed you. There's no sign of this. And it almost feels like nighttime. Anybody who wants to could probably run back inside, fetch a lantern. Uh, yeah, that really would have taken the book and the camera and stuff back into the house and gotten oh, the lantern. Great idea. Great and idea. so, after about that kind of 45 minutes or so, you you get to the point, Shima, where when you place, you kind of shove the shovel back inside the, the dirt, you hear a ting, the sound of metal on metal. You hit something. You start kind of clearing away. It's a couple feet down. And you, reel, and you pull out a metal box of decent size, um, bigger than a shoebox, basically. It's got the color of a gun, basically. It's kind of gun metal box. It's uh, got some cake mud and such on it. Um, and you notice right as you start pulling the box out, right as the tink happens, the sky literally opens up and this deluge of rain begins to start just pouring down atop all of you. You also look up and anybody who wants you see by Carruthers cottage. The old man is standing there. There is a lantern hanging from a hook on like an eave above his, uh, above his cottage. The dogs are staring there and they're, and he's literally looking out, seeing you guys dig into the cemetery of, of the Henslow estate. But Shima, you pull it out and you got this box in your hand. What do you want to do? Uh, am I the only one out here? Everyone else has gone inside. I would have been outside. Okay. Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. Um, right next uh, to you. I'm. I'm gonna. I haven't. I don't think noticed her others. I've been really focused on this and uh, realizing what a fucking mess the only clothes I have are, <laughs> and uh, uh, really. Now that I have the box out, I'm gonna try and try and open it. Um, is should, it locked should, or should we take it on under the under the cover? My my goodness, oh, this, this rain is just not letting up. Uh, I don't know why I didn't think for that. Yes, that's a good <laughs> idea. I, I can uh, grasp the other side uh, if you'd like. It's not that, that heavy. Well. It, it's well. it's like slightly bigger than a shoebox. Like it, it probably doesn't take two people. But um, is it just like stainless steel or like is is it rusted? It's not stainless is steel, it? but like it's not rusted. Uh, it's in relatively good shape. It's like a gunmetal box. You're not sure what it is. It might be like a uh, might be like a foot locker, something like that. Um, okay, it has no markings on it. Like there's no there's nothing to suggest like who it who it's who owns it or if there's a stamp of or anything like that on it. Uh, but it's just a metal box. Um, okay. We'll say that you guys hurry underneath one of the, like onto like the back porch of the yeah, house. Yeah. 
yeah. out of the rain a little bit. It's still pouring down. Um, you you open it up, Shime. It doesn't doesn't take any trouble opening it up. It's just just giving a slight little bit of elbow grease. And the first thing you notice um, is a flat and jagged square stone uh, that's decorated with this kind of raised but worn glyph that looks like a, a lidded eye that's been stylized into a rune or a glyph of some kind. Um, it has some sort of jagged broken marks along the side. It, ha- it looks like it's, it's been broken off something else, like, like someone like chiseled or like hacked it off of maybe like a statue or, a, or like a, a, a wall or something like that. Um, so that's the first thing you pull up. Immediately beneath that, you notice that there is a translucent envelope uh, that you can see is addressed to Walter Winston. And when you pull that out, beneath that, wrapped in plastic, as you start to slowly unwrap that, uh, you see a notebook uh, that is uh, that is like the, at the very bottom of the box. Um, so those are the three things that you see. What do you guys do? Oh, Dr. Key, the, the lantern, perfect timing. Uh, perfect timing for us to see all of this. I am I am spending I am immediately enthralled by the flat jagged stone um and looking at like sort of turning that over and and really focus on it is that a symbol I have seen in any of my readings so far let's find or out anything. roll in a <laughs> roll in a cult test okay I'm gonna toss people towels or any dry cloth I can find uh, yeah you yes. can run inside you get a few things here and there they're kind of dusty there's a little bit of an odor to them but you're able as you bring them out patrick like people can dry off uh, is very grateful again to having three nice things <laughs> uh, uh, while uh, they there. were messing with the box i think pastor wood would have wanted to go over to carruthers okay okay so you truck across and you can see carruthers is he, you can't see him anymore once you actually close in and stand on the back porch. Like once you were far away on the cemetery, the angle was such that you can see them. Um, but you cut, you kind of, you can head over, you can trudge through the lantern still there. Um, when you pass by, uh, the gate, you notice your car is out there. Uh, the headlights are on. You can see the headlights are kind of popped up and are on, uh, here and there, but the car's there. Um, and you kind of trudge over to his cottage. Uh, we'll resolve that in a second. So, Shima, what did you roll on your occult test? 35 under 50. Okay, so you definitely recognize the symbol. Um, it might have been something you saw similar or like on, on among the kind of hodgepodge of, of warding symbols you saw on the walls of the sanitarium. And if you guys have shared some of it, maybe even some in here or two. Um, but more specifically... Uh, you notice it as probably or possibly being derived from the artworks of the Axum Empire. Uh, and you would know that according to what you have read about it, what you have studied, uh, that it might somehow be associated with spying or scrying spells, mystical surveillance, that sort of thing. That's what the eye uh, is tended to to represent. Um, so generally the, the kingdom of Axum for, for those of you, quick Wikipedia sort of summary. It's, um, it was a kingdom in East Africa and South Arabia from essentially classical antiquity, uh, like during the middle ages. So that's what this is in reference to. All right. Uh, the, uh sorry, there's just, just making some notes. Um, this is a, it's a symbol that uh, allows for squaring or prevents squaring. Yeah. It's, it's meant to block a ward oh, okay yeah. okay to ward against squaring. um she immediately points that out to uh dr key uh specifically noting that it is from the axe member um then uh there were two other things in there as well um one was an envelope addressed to walter winston 
Uh, and then other another uh, is basically the uh, what looks to be like a journal wrapped up in plastic. Uh, who takes those? Beverly probably would have grabbed the journal and handed the letter to Patrick. Okay, sounds good. Um, all right, so I'm going to assuming. I'm going to go ahead and just put some items just so I can keep track of who's got what. So Beverly, you said you were taking the notebook. Uh, and then we get more uh, handouts. We get more handouts. We'll say, <laughs> and then we'll say, Sh- uh, Shima, you, uh, I you grab the, the Right. Okay. So let me just throw that uh, on your sheet. Okay. So, then we'll start with the note, uh, which we'll say Patrick has, we said. All right, so Patrick, I will kind of share this to everybody. Um, you can read this if you like. Uh, did you, were you able to see that? Try that again. No, I don't think I did. I'll do it one more time. Sorry about that. Uh, sorry, it's being a little silly. All right, here we go. All right, so go ahead. You can read that, Patrick. That's um, that's the note from uh, to written to Walter Winston. I'm sure the notes I notes I took during our investigations after complying with what I saw and what I remember into this notebook. The stone you might recognize I took from the barn that night. I think it was ease. I know the thing watches me. If it wanted to hurt me, I think it could. I hope you're careful. I put our materials in a safe deposit box in the first bank of Long Beach before coming home. The key is here. Use it wisely. I know you will. Don't come for me. I don't think I have it in me anymore to do the work. I don't trust myself anymore. Thank you for coming this far. Signed D. Shime, I think that that rock you have is the key to the bank. I, I'm I'm sorry, Mr. Price. Did you just say that 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 stone there is going to get us into a safe deposit box in the bank? Did that did did I hear that right? That is what I said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, well, I, I would, I would love to see the, the banker's face if we brought that in as a key to enter. Oh, that's it. it Ashima, are you sure there wasn't anything further in the box? Kind of holds the box upside down right. in case she's missed anything. <laughs> so, Beverly, when you open up, uh, the notebook, uh, mm-hmm. you can see on the inside cover kind of tucked inside, uh, like the, the covers fold. There is in fact a key that kind of tumbles out and clinks onto the ground like a penny. Um, okay. and whoever will, whoever wants to pick that up. So, so Patrick, if you want to pick that up, oh, maybe it's this key. Um, Beverly, as you're flipping through, it is a dense notebook and it is kind of a combination of like diary and sketchbook. And it's written in like a, the familiar hand of Douglas Henslow. And it's going to take time to obviously read through it all, but just like a yeah. quick glance of it, you can definitely tell it, it seems to be documenting some of his memories and such um, during the investigation that you took with Walter Winston. But the short, but there's like a, a mad kind of shorthand to it. It's, it's written by uh, an unwell mind. Uh, you can definitely tell okay. yeah. um, there's a lot of sort of a jumbled stream of consciousness going on. And as you're flipping through, you notice with a little bit of a start, uh, Beverly, that there are some, there are some sketches first. Um, one of them just seems to be a sketch of like, one of them says, you know, Catherine, one of them says Walter kind of just seems to be, he's like sketching the people um, that he was on the investigative team with. But then as you're flipping through, you notice there are some extraordinarily gruesome and violent images of figures that are dancing and writhing against this huge, like, licking flame. Um, There's also drawings of these multi-limbed, headless form with arms and tentacles and legs ending in these dripping mouths. And a lot of these illustrations seem to depict... uh, the form itself biting the heads off of humans or tearing human figures apart. Uh, there are, in fact, uh, a couple handouts I'll show as, as sort of samples of uh, what you see. 
Uh, so there's the first. And then I will give you the second as well. Now, anybody who will say everybody but Pastor Wood, because he has effectively stepped away uh, towards Carruthers, is everybody there, the four of you on the back, uh, as you maybe Beverly, maybe read a line or two out loud, and maybe there was a little bit of a start as like you see some of these disgusting images. All of you go ahead and make a sand test for that. Oh, my goodness. Oh. I reach across the graveyard and slap it out of their hands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Good gracious. 49, I believe I passed. Oh, no, I'm looking the wrong one. 71. 52 <laughs> over 50. Oh, that's a 87 fail. over 58. Yeah. Okay. 80 over 60. All of you failed. All of you take a <laughs> one, one point of sanity loss. Uh, as this, it's, it's, it's very unsettling. Very, very unsettling. Um, and while you guys are dealing with that, we'll cut over to Pastor Wood. So Pastor Wood, you had kind of a Across the um, the divide between the plantation house and the cottage, uh, and this is specifically like right up against the wall. You had to pass in front of uh, the main entrance. You see the the car waiting for you, um, and when you when you get over to the cottage, he's he seems to have gone back inside. The door is still open. You hear the sounds of a sermon now playing. And you can see, you know, you hear. Very familiar references. Uh, and when you peek in, it's a very cramped, cluttered place. Uh, you can see the, the very small room is dominated in, in one corner where Carruthers is now seated. And this worn out easy chair, there is a console radio sitting right next to him. And that's where the sermon is coming from. Um, all hardwood layered with like these tattered rugs and you can see the, the hounds are laid out here and there. There's various fishing rods and such on the hooks. And there's like a mounted sort of fish like up on one of the walls. But um, when he sees you. Guess you all found what are you looking for? Well, it appears to be so. It remains to be seen whether there's more to look for, though. Hmm. Well, Mr. Henslow, he, uh, he spent time, I seen, digging out there. Last time he was here. You're a godly fella, are you? Indeed I am. Proud to say so. You don't mind me saying, why don't you take what you found? Take your friends. Go with God and go with grace. And you leave this family alone. Yeah? I have no intention of harassing your family. Hmm. Ain't no reason Mother Henslow has to know what you all found back there. And I ain't gonna tell her. And I think none of you all should either. I see no reason that she should be disturbed with this. Hmm. Is there any other remnants of Mr. Henslow's past that you wish we would take with us? I didn't change a thing since he was last here. His room stayed the same. And we saw him moving around plenty of time out in the dark. But the last time, just before uh, that one fella showed up causing problems, you found where he was. There ain't nothing left. I think it's time for y'all to go. Respectfully. I understand. Very well. Mr. Carruthers, I nod and I turn to leave. You hear um, 
He just kind of reaches out. He kind of turns the sermon up a little louder. And you just hear like a little fire and brimstone kind of start cackling through. And it. Master Wood doesn't say anything. Yeah. Slowly. But he's very annoyed that Carruthers likes that sermon, but didn't like the one that I gave him personally. (laughs) Turned and walked (laughs) away from that one. (laughs) When you get back to the porch, you see the looks on their faces are a little like they're a little paled uh, in a way they kind of have like they look a little bit um, well, they look a little frightened or disgusted something like that each, each, each definitely forward. aghast and yeah. found more I, I, of the devil's work then have you this is what Best we time. mean to investigate well, I reckon it's time for us to take our leave. Why don't we pack up that box and we can discuss it on the way back? I, or rather, discuss it when we reach the hotel. Yes. Uh, and Beverly is actively packing this all back into the metal um, box that we had it in. Um, we should... Was there... And she looks to Shima. Was there anything else concerning in his bookshelf that should be removed from this property? Only the the book that we found, the photograph and the Francis Hickory's book, but uh, the uh, frankly, the the better version of this is in the library. But they wouldn't hurt to take this. I doubt Mrs. Hazel would miss it. Oh no! Uh, okay. Yeah, as long as you're sure there's nothing else that should have been removed, uh, I think we'll take uh, things actually, and go. Just meta, I'm realizing that I don't think I actually scanned the rest of the bookshop for occult books. Uh, I'm, but I'm, but Pastor would spend some time in there yeah. later, so probably not necessary to go back and do it again. Uh, pa- Pastor Wood, like there is an array of, of things in there. Um, not one specific book particularly stood out to you other than the Francis Hickering one, obviously, that you have. Right. Right. Um, there's nothing else that kind of really uh, drew your attention immediately because I think the two okay. of you, or maybe it was Shima who was actually doing the initial scan, like there was nothing in there yeah. that like just screamed rare uh, and okay. strange that you couldn't find elsewhere. Thank you. Well, and in, in speaking with with Miss Virginia, it doesn't appear that she has any plans to go through his belongings. So it, it would appear that if we've taken what seems relevant to us, I imagine it could be years before anyone else goes in any of those rooms again. Okay, yeah. So, I'm not a gambling man, but I would bet that Mr. Henslow destroyed anything valuable or yeah. disturbing, and that the stash here is all that was left. Oh, I, I, there's quite quite enough disturbing in that box, in that notebook for us, I, I, I do believe. I, uh, shall we get out of the rain? Get back to the car. And she's, this is the second time today that she's been distressed by something that she's seen, so. And she'll kind of take her jacket off and kind of wrap the box in the jacket, um, and then kind of look to see if we're all going to make a run for the car. Yes. Yeah, pretty much. And then much. she runs to the yeah. car. Okay. You run to the car while someone opens the gate, creaks open, closes behind you. You get over to the driver. Um, driver, like, kind of comes out, and he's, like, very quickly trying to open the door for you, Marie, as you're out in front. Like, oh, oh me. Uh, let me get that for you. Uh, I thought y'all were going to be in there all day. Oh my god! It's just kind of open the doors here and there. Careful now, careful. Uh, and like thank you're, you, thank s- you. you're splotched. Like there's like puddles everywhere, and like you're slipping and sliding. Those of you who are running down uh, the slope, as like the mud is really beginning to thicken, and like water is just dribbling everywhere. As the thunderstorm is just immense. Like it is, it is going um, much harder than when you sort of first started digging outside uh, and like you're a driver like you know you're like well you know you didn't say I was going to be driving around in in such state but no it's fine it's fine it's just everyone uh, good thing I think we got one of these new ones with all the 
Well, I think we can see. We're just going to have to drive a little bit more slowly, though, just so it's all safe and everything. We, we, will, book we will tip you and, and we will pay you extra for the cleaning as she looks down at her shoes and all the mud that we're we tracking will. into the vehicle. Uh, well, of course, it would only be right to. So she, he looked like all very excited, which is as if, but then faster, he's like, uh, well, we can just say it's, uh, call it even, man, for the, the issues on our, on our way out here. Yeah. But, uh, we are yes, all I do believe up. we did have a pre-negotiated, uh, price. There's no reason to go back and open that book again, Miss Wynn. Indeed, sir. Indeed, sir. And so you all start traveling away. It, it is almost like, it's basically like nighttime as you're traveling away and like the ground, like you, you almost feel like hydroplaning every now and then, like you're just kind of, when you make these turns and your swerves, like the country roads are thick with mud. Like you, you actually have to have the windows up because the rain is so intense. And so it's even thicker. Like anybody in here, like that is you, you just, you just feel each other, like your shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow, um, like sweat, is sort of beginning to pour and like he's constantly reaching up and kind of like wiping the inside of the windshield off as like it begins to steam a bit. <clears throat> Ugh. Um, probably about, oh, it's about a half an hour or so, not too far from uh, maybe around where you had broke down before. Um, you all see on the side of the road um, in the dark, like a headlight, of another vehicle on the side of the road and you see a shadow kind of move out and kind of waving. You see a man kind of, he's kind of got his jacket over top here and there and he's kind of waving here and there. And your driver's like, Oh, well, oh, that's terrible. Could, could have been worse. I suppose. Could be, could be like that poor fella. We could have, we could have broke down in the middle of the thunderstorm, but, but I had the good fortune uh, to not do so. Uh, uh, you kinda, uh why don't you go ahead and pull stop. over here? We can be good hey. Samaritans. Uh, well, I suppose, uh, uh, sure, I suppose we can do that. Uh, that's that's how we do things down here in Savannah. We're hospitable folk. And so he, he slows down and kind of pulls alongside this broke down car. And he kind of can, kind of cranks the window down a bit. And you can see this man uh, who had the kind of covering over him. Very dark, like there's the, the, the headlights starts running around towards you. And he's like, again, kind of like what... You know, you normally see people do, guys do sometimes when they're trying to use their coat to cover the rain. Um, and he comes around in the, like to the driver's side and the driver's like, hey, car trouble there, mister? And right as the guy comes around uh, to the window, he kind of drops his jacket. And all of this kind of happens at once. White man, Caucasian, sort of pale, his eyes are kind of sunken. You can see there's these strange crawl of tattoos kind of going up his neck a bit and up what now appears to be like a, a rolled up sleeve. And he thrusts his arm inside the car and there's a flash of light as a blade is in his hand, the headlights of the car reflecting off of it. And he does in two quick successions, just kind of stabs right into the driver. And your driver's like, ah, ah, And in a panic, he just slams his foot down on the gas. And the car lurches forward and starts sliding this way and that. Ah, and you guys oh, hear him screaming. Patrick, you grab the steering wheel. Like, you steady him out, but his foot's still going, so you're doing your best. Uh, then all of you notice up ahead, there's a second set of like lights that just suddenly pop out of the darkness on the front of the road and they're getting closer and closer. They're getting, they're getting bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden, Patrick, as you're trying your best to steer, your driver's just screaming and pain like, ah, my chest, I'm bleeding, I'm bleeding. You guys hear this, this sudden and terrible like screech and swerve uh, of tires and you feel this intense crash as that second vehicle slams into you. Uh, Patrick, give me a driving test. Roll high, don't die. This I'm the only one with driving skills. <laughs> yeah, use driving use tests dice, are boostable. So you can you can roll you can use it you, you can use a uh, an audience boost to get plus plus ten percent. I'll take two. 
just uh, yeah. I think we just do one or did we just well, do? I it's been one do. or two. Okay. Because it's a hundred percent. Okay. So right, I need go a forty five. Go for it. Hey, you five. Okay. Wow. You Hell you keep yes. hang out, everybody. You, keep, you go ahead and you keep the uh, the the vehicle safe. You kind of cut it ever so slightly, and you do it at just the last minute. And in doing so, like the car that slams into you manages to basically clip you as opposed to T-bone you entirely. Your car goes spinning and spinning and kind of slams into a road. You can feel it almost tip like it was about to roll over down into the swamp, but instead kind of wraps around uh, one of the trees. Everybody roll a contest. Oh. Everybody roll a contest. Goodness. Twelve under fifty. Fifteen under fifty. Sixty-seven under eighty. Eighty-five okay. over fifty. Oh okay. no. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have I have <laughs> not passed a single test today. I like to imagine you're nice. like up against one of the doors and so yeah. you've got like nowhere to like uh, slide to. <laughs> Sixty-one under seventy. Okay, so I think only Beverly failed, is that correct? Yeah, that, that's what it sounds okay. like. Yeah, everybody who passed take two points of damage as you're thrown and sloshed around. Uh, Beverly, go ahead and take uh, take uh, five points of damage uh, as you unfortunately are maybe you're on the side of the car uh, that, that smashes into the uh, the tree itself and you just get crunched into it. You maybe you're in the driver's side rear. Uh, mm -hmm. You and the driver kind of wrapped around and he's like, ah, he's bleeding. Um, while that's like, all, while, while you guys are kind of getting your senses uh, as you're sort of looking up, you're, the car is still kind of running. The driver's panicking here and there. There's random headlights shining, these little uh, like, like streaks of light in the otherwise kind of dark and rainy terrain. You all see groups of people charging out you. Uh, in the back seat, you all hear crash as like this brass knuckled wearing uh, like like fist cracks through the window and it's going to and you, it basically grabs. Let's see what it grabs. Uh, it's going to grab uh, Patrick out of the, uh, the driver's side and begins to pull him and throw him basically out through the pa out through the passenger side door. Patrick, he goes slip sliding across on the ah. mud. On the driver's side in the back, again, all of you are, are kind of wheeling around. This is effectively like a surprise round. Uh, Beverly, you're back there smashed against. Uh, you feel hands grab you. Uh, you can feel they're tugging a little bit. You feel a bit of your clothes kind of uh, tear from it. The pain that you're feeling, maybe one of your arms is kind of going numb, your left arm going slightly numb from being pinned. But you feel like the door like wrench open and you and you feel like, what looks like like hand like these thick heavy hands this this breathing just coming down on you that feels warm and 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 just wet and they drag you out and they kind of reach their hand back and they start kind of just swinging down um as the car at this point is surrounded uh as those of you kind of get your get your eyes back and you look around a bit your car is surrounded by what looks like five men of both Caucasian and like maybe like kind of Southeast Asian sort of a uh, uh, national, you're not sure exactly just from the quick look of it, but you can see a mix, all of them bearing these tattoos uh, kind of up and down their arms and necks. Uh, and we're going to go into combat uh, now at this point as Patrick oh, and Beverly, gosh. you have been dragged outside of the car. The rest of you are still in your driver is bleeding out. Uh, rain is pouring around you, um, and that's what we're going to do now. Um, so I'm a fighter, y'all. <laughs> right. Rolled at random. Okay. Uh, so, um, as you all are getting ready to go, uh, Marie and Pastor Wood, you actually have the highest. 
Uh, and you can see that on the driver's side, there are two, one of them that is basically pulling Beverly out. One of them that's kind of chasing up behind, got a knife in his hand, likely the one who actually stabbed the driver to begin with, who's like kind of chasing up to the driver's side of the car. Uh, then you can see on the opposite side, um, like, or I would say right to the front of the car, there's like a, a third kind of on the driver's side that's coming in your direction. Then two more are clamoring, clamoring down from the road, from that muddy road and slowly moving up behind. You see this large, thick, muscular woman of just like her, her hair is tied back. You can see there's all sorts of tattoos all around her neck and up towards her face. And she is basically like stretching her arm out here and there. And she's sliding this glinting bit of brass knuckles. They each kind of scream out and like you hear them like yell to each other in a language that makes no sense. You just hear that's like this mix of of like sibilance, like S's and F's, but also vowels. And, and it just, it just burns away at your ears. Everybody roll a sand test, please. Thank goodness. 14 under 57 passed. Very nice. Very nice. You're okay. Nine under 60. Very good. 20 over 59 passed. Good, good. I failed real hard with that 91 Shima, over also Patrick Simon and Patrick both take a point of sanity loss as they you this language not only does it not sound like anything you've heard before but it it does something like it, it kind of un unclicks something in your mind and your eyes just sort of like kind of shift ever so slightly as about a bout of vertigo or something comes over top of you as you just try to like what the like the how are they making that sound? It almost sounds like a like a snake slithering and speaking at the same time. And, you, and and when they look at you, their faces are twisted and contorted. And it just for a moment in the in the the light of the headlights in the darkness of the rain, it just it's like the boogeyman's attacking you now. Um, and now let's get into initiative. So, Marie, uh, you are first to go. You're the first who rouses yourself. Um, we will say that you are, um, we'll say middle front seat. You just saw Patrick dragged out one. The, the driver's side is pinned against a tree. You can't get out that way. There's a giant crash uh, in the windshield in front of you. What do you want to do, Marie? Uh, so, Marie is going to... See if she can go kind of running after the one that pulled uh, Mr. Price out of the car. And so she's going to kind of basically just make sort of an improvised little weapon with the heel of her shoe. <laughs> so that's what she's going to go kind of chasing after it. this guy. Absolutely. So you go chasing after Patrick. Uh, you can move enough. You can get it. He only he basically just got pulled out a couple steps. Door still open. You slide on out rain pouring down you have the heel of your shoe and you start swinging at the man um that is getting ready to just pound patrick in the face with this like brass knuckle in his fist uh go ahead and roll your attack so this is our first real actual combat we had a very slight taste of it before um, but if you're unfamiliar with call of cthulhu you basically get one generic action around you get a slight bit of movement it's very theater of the mind that's how we're going to play it we're not going to be extraordinarily precise with everything um but uh, you step out and you go up to swing. Go ahead and roll your attack. Yeah. He is so, going to, seeing you come out, uh, he is going to attempt to fight back. Okay, yeah. So I, I just dragged over a small knife just to, as a fill-in for the shoe. Um, sure. But I rolled a 64, uh, which would be a fail by quite a bit. Okay. He's going to, he's like I said, he's going to attempt to, uh, to fight back. Uh, as you come running up, he's getting ready to swing down at Patrick, but he sees you coming up and he changes his target and he instead starts to swing at you. So fight back basically means it's a contested. He needs to win, meaning a higher level of, of, of a higher degree of success in order to be able to essentially okay. hit you. Uh, right. so that's what he'll attempt to do. Uh, so he is going to roll a 25 under 50. Uh, so that's a six, that's a, that's a hard success for him right on the button. What's yours, Marie? Okay. Uh, I failed. I rolled a 64. So, so you come I would swinging have to spend and you're swinging and you're hitting, um, 
you're hitting him with the shoe. Uh, but it's like kind of ineffectual. It's getting, it, it's covered in mud. It's, it's maybe it's kind of losing some of its, some of its physical physicality. Yeah, I'm having a hard time gripping it because it's raining <laughs> with his, with his, with his fist, uh, like backhands, like doesn't care one bit and just smashes you across the face. Uh, you will take, uh, some damage. You're going to take, you're going to take seven points of damage. Oh gosh. All right. A little tooth comes loose. Blood goes spurting out. We go over to pastor wood, uh, pastor wood. What would you like to do? I think it would be fair to say that I did not bring my pistol on this occasion, saying that there would not be any danger. We've been here before. So I will grab out my pocket knife Fair. And go after the man that has grabbed Dr. Key. Okay. So we'll say maybe you were in the back seat then with Beverly. She was right next to you. She happened, you gave, maybe you were a gentleman and gave her the window. She gets dragged out. You go hurtling after her. Okay. So we'll say, I'm just kind of moving our tokens on the map just to give us an, just to kind of keep track of everything. Uh, and so that means we'll say over here on the left. All right, go ahead there, Pastor Wood. Um, I and the think knife would be considered brawl. Brawl, yeah, yeah. Brawl covers most like small weapons. Like it has to be like a sword or something like that for it to really not cover. Uh, all right, so he's also going to fight back as well. That is a forty-five under fifty, just barely a success. All right, let's nice. see what I got. Well, buddy, I'll even show it to you uh, in case you don't believe me. I rolled a five under fifty. Uh, so what? he, as you come charging in, you thrust the knife, he steps out of the way, you slice the knife kind of across what looks like, you know, is the, this is sort of baggy wet clothing. And he just turns around and just right with his, right with his fist, right into your stomach, uh, to sort of sock you. Um, so, man, I'm rolling great so far, guys. Uh, three points of damage though. Three points of damage. As you feel the wind, <gasps> just immediately evacuate uh, your lungs. Okay, uh, next up. Um, so hang on, let me go through these. That was past her. The one that was kind of winding up her arm, she just comes, comes stumbling down. She grins a little bit. Her teeth are rotten. You can tell, uh, I'll say Patrick and Marie, you can see like this definitely feels like they're infected. They're kind of rotting away a bit. And she comes, she just, uh, she just kind of grins as she steps up. Um, let's see. Does she go right towards Marie and Patrick? Uh, no, I don't think she does. I think she targets <laughs> Shima. Uh, see, she's, Shima is the last one in the car. She steps past Marie and Patrick, who are engaged with these other thugs, and steps up and goes and reaches in and grabs Shima and tries to literally throw her. Uh, as uh, Shima, you're being attacked. You could basically, you have an option. You could try and dodge, or you can try and fight back. Dodge, you would roll dodge, and then you're, you would just need to pass. You don't, or you just need to tie in terms of the degree of success. So tie goes to the, okay. to the dodge. You can fight back, which has the opportunity to actually get a hit off in if you beat her. So like, let's say, let's say you dodge and you, we both roll successes, just regular successes. You would win. You would not take any damage. You'd be, be fine. Let's say instead of you fought back and we both rolled, rolled our tests, we both got regular successes. You would not win the uh, fighting back. You need to actually get better. Does that make sense? It does. So you would need to get like uh, a hard success if she succeeded, that kind of thing. So the tie, so like that's basically the difference between uh, the two. Uh, okay. So she's coming for you and she's essentially trying to, uh, like, what I'm going to, I'm treating this almost like a fighting maneuver where I'm, she's going to grab you and try to throw you onto the ground and make you prone. Uh, like I'm going to try and dodge. Uh, okay. Because I. All uh, right. Uh, also, I was looking at my character sheet. I definitely don't have my club or my knife for me for the same reason the boss was said. But I think I definitely do have my brass knuckles with me. Yeah, that's fair. I'm fine I with that. I don't think she, she goes anywhere without them. Yeah, um, that, that, that works for me. Okay. Uh, dodge. I was so dodge. Go ahead and roll your dodge. 
versus it's going to be her 40 girl under test. 70. Okay, 40 under 70 is a success. Uh, I also succeeded with a 70 under 95. Uh, however, that is just a regular <laughs> success. Uh, so you, she reaches in, she kind of grabs you by the leg. You thrust with your other leg and kind of kick and she stumbles back. You're still inside the car, but you, uh, you haven't been effectively like manhandled and dragged outside. So, so you did not take any kind of effect, but she is standing right there at the open back door of this vehicle. So she opened the door and tried to like grab me out. Like she tried to drag. She literally tried. She's enormous. And she tried to like grab you and literally throw you uh, okay. across. So uh, as across the as I kick her, then I don't know, she's like, <laughs> and then so and then put my own brass knuckles on, which okay. say "Lux in tenebris," <laughs> which is Latin Very for nice. light in the darkness. <laughs> nice. Uh, all right. Next up, um, next up is going to be, uh, the one that, uh, dragged out Beverly. Um, okay. He's going to punch Beverly. Um, I think he's going to go back to punching Beverly. Yeah, let's do that. Um, you're on the ground too, right? Yeah. Uh, that's sorry. what you said. I got thrown yeah. out. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right. Here we go. Uh, so he's just going to try to... He's basically gonna, just going to try to kick you in the head. Uh, as I think he was going to do. Let's get that roll. You can choose... You can still choose to dodge or fight back, um, Ashley. Uh, you're still able to do that? Uh, all of them are awful options for me, but I'll try and dodge. Okay. <laughs> And you can take a boost just to give you a little extra chance. Uh, yeah, I'll do one. Don't forget about luck, too. You guys can use luck on skill rolls, but you can't use luck on luck or sanity or damage rolls. But you certainly can use rock on a, on a brawl test or something like that or a dodge test. You're welcome to use luck, not just to succeed, but to increase the level of success. However, once... I declare what my people rolled. I'm going to say like, you, you know, like, like we're not going to like sort of metagame it like crazy. Like I'll let you guys, guys know, like, like, are you, like, are you spending luck at that point? That kind of thing. So you're going to spend so, like the three I'll to make it a success. Three. Actually, no, yeah. no, I know we, we can still play. Luck. No, no, I was wrong. Forget what I just said. Uh, but yeah, you can change. You can use, you can spend three luck to be successful at your dodge check there. Yeah. Properly to go That's, from 25 to 28. Spend that. Yeah. Uh, okay. You could also spend, um, you can also spend, what's it called? Uh, I can do the math. Um, you need to get down to 12. You can also spend 16 to get that to a hard success. Uh, yeah, because I really can't afford to be hit again. Yeah, and I'm, that's why I'm telling you that. So, uh, so he starts kicking away at the ground. He tries to lift his this giant boot and curb stomp you right in the face, uh, but you manage to roll out of the way. Um, you also, as part of like a dodge, you can actually stand up if you wanted to, or you can do that in your turn. It's kind of up to you. So you can scramble up from prone at this point because you were successful yeah. with your hard success. Okay. So that is the end of that one's turn. Then we come to Shima's turn. Shima, you are inside the car. We'll say you slid on your knuckles. You're ready to go. There's this big woman standing in front of you. She's got a deranged look on her face. The, the language that these are communicating with makes no sense screwing around with your head. What do you want to do, Shima? Uh, if she's, especially if she's the closest to me, I want to launch myself at her with a fighting brawl. Okay. That's just a brawl? That is just a brawl. Okay. Uh, I will fight back. She's a freaking uh, badass. Oh, God. I know. I'm scared. <laughs> Get that the is a 46 under 85. Uh, that's very good. It's a regular success. Uh, rolled a 55 under 95. So you still succeed. As I tried to fight back, uh, I would need to beat your level of success. So since we both tied at a regular success, you are you are successful. You can roll your damage. Uh, so that's a 1d3 on the brass stun because I'm just going to roll a d6 and half it. Yeah, it also should be plus your uh, your damage bonus. Oh, okay. So I rolled a 
four on the da- uh, so pardon me, two, be a two on the dice. So be a two. Uh, where's my damage bonus? Uh, it's on your sheet. It's a D4. right of your so sheet. Roll a D4 as well. Oh, okay. So it's two so far plus a D4. Two plus four. Six. Did you did you roll a four on the D4? Yeah. Okay, so six points of damage. Sure. Got it. All right. So as she's like, as she kind of stumbles back from the kick, you come lunging out and just right, right there, square, right in the chest, right in the sternum. She stumbles back a little bit and you can see her kind of slide on the ground a bit as like her back leg begins to kind of firmly plant itself in the mud and you can see the mud kind of cake. And then she steps up and she looks wild craziness in her eyes. <laughs> and we will continue. Uh, so. Oh, no. Uh, next. Sibling, it's fine. <laughs> uh, next up will be one of the ones that's on the, um, we'll say this, the one that stabbed the driver. All they're going to do on this turn, because they have to catch up because you guys went spinning and sliding off the road, they're going to spend their entire turn basically running to catch up with where Pastor Wood and Beverly are on the driver's side of the vehicle. Uh, So currently, we have Pastor Wood and Beverly on the driver's side of the vehicle with essentially three of these these thugs, is what I'm calling them for now. Uh, And then the rest of you uh, are on the passenger side with two thugs that are trying to essentially beat Marie and Patrick and one thug boss that is in a fight with Shima. Uh, Patrick, it is your turn. What would you like to do? Grab a handful of mud on the ground, toss it up. I've got a razor falling behind that to one of the guys in front of me. Okay. Uh, are you going to, so you want to attack with a razor? Like so effectively. Okay. Go ahead and give, uh, give a roll, uh, with, uh, That'll be a brawl still since you have a razor. 63. Sp- what is it? 13 to get to success. I'm just going to try to dodge. Uh, on this one. Okay. Uh, yeah, just spend your 13 because I failed my dodge. If you want to spend your 13 uh, luck to get to a success. Yeah, I'll spend uh, it use- So they're trying to like pound and beat away on Marie. This is the one that backhanded Marie. Um, they actually had a, um, a penalty die, uh, because they had already reacted to Marie. So by now having to react again, uh, they get a penalty die on their, their next roll. So, um, cause they are what's called overwhelmed. Uh, so it's three points of damage to thug number five. All right. So you slash them across a bit of blood <sighs> and, uh, the rain begins to sort of make the blood blossom a bit in their otherwise white shirt. Um, nice. Okay. Next up then is another one of these on the side who is going to, I think, charge at Patrick. Uh, I'm assuming you, you stood up, Patrick. Yeah. Okay. They're going to charge at you. You went for a knife. Well, guess what, buddy? They're also going to slash at you at a knife. And they do the classic Crocodile Dundee where they hold their knife up in the headlight. Like, that's not a knife. Now that's a knife, as it's much bigger than yours. <laughs> One might say medium. Uh, and he's going to try to slash at you. Um, now, have you used a dodge or, or fight back maneuver yet? I have not, so I will fight back. Okay, so you're going to fight back. Perfect. All right, so go ahead and roll your attack, your brawl skill again, as they will do the same. You've stood up. 25 that should be it's under 50 that's a hard success. Uh, that is a hard success you you do in fact get through them as they come charging in they slash at you patrick you dodge out of the way and then you thrust forward and slash across the face with your razor blade roll your damage it's not the size of the knife it's the user <laughs> 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 Wisdom it's from the barber. Uh, yeah, it's gotta just roll your damage. Yeah, just a one, just one point. Hey, man, it's more than they did to you. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. Like we said, he's not a barber. Uh, then um, <laughs> the one that dragged Marie out. Um, 
or drag Patrick out. We'll say we'll try to, yeah, he'll try to just kind of kick Marie in the face. Um, Marie, what do you want to do? Have you uh, tried to dodge or fight back already? We're still in the first round, so yes. Okay, so whatever. I think, yeah. yeah. So I think you're going to have a penalty die as you're technically overwhelmed. There's now two that are fighting you. Okay, so I am trying to dodge. Um, and then how do you do that where it's a penalty? Oh, yeah, uh, minus so when one. you go to roll, there'll be a pop-up window if you're doing it through the system and just drag it over to yep. the okay. penalty side. What? Uh, <laughs> okay, you, successful. Uh, but you did not roll with a penalty die. Roll another tens die. I don't think. Okay. I, I only see one tens die having been rolled. Okay. I did a, my, sorry, I'm just rolling in. It's okay. Uh, you can spend one point so of luck 30, to make that a success. Five. Okay. So, okay. So, so yes, I will do that. All right. And so they kick at you uh, as they kind of come flying through and they try to just do this like side kick to your hip. You do manage to step away your your like your one bare foot kind of sliding and ducking under uh, and you are OK. Then we come to Beverly Key. Poor Beverly. <laughs> you didn't sign up for this. You were so excited to dig. Uh, and just and read just books and accident. shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I... My thought that I want to do is I want to get into the car and push the driver over and get in the driver's seat. Okay. And try and, uh, like, start the car again, ooh. see if it will work. Okay. Um, that sounds great. Uh, we'll say uh, the movement's easy enough uh, to get over and scramble, and he is bleeding profusely. He got stabbed twice in the chest. Mm -hmm. blood everywhere on the seat um i'll tell you this R give me a give me a strength times five to see if you can just basically push him out of the way um you're you're effectively crawling through the back of the car like the back seat into yeah, the front like the seat and dragging mm -hmm. him to the side yeah dr k's got driving skills she's got the best weapon uh here Oh my god, ninety five. I just sit oh, on his lap. No. Then. So, okay. Here's the here's the stakes. What I'll say is like you're still gonna be able to do it, or you can slide onto his lap, like you said. But if you wanted to spend forty five luck, you could you could pull him. I don't have enough. Okay. All right. Uh, so we'll say you. He's he's he's. Un, we'll say he's unconscious. Even we'll say he's just okay. basically unconscious. Okay. Uh, but you you crawl on top of him uh, and you are sitting on his lap. And uh, boy, if and you're she's calling, apologizing. You can see you now. <laughs> she's apologizing <laughs> profusely. <laughs> so scandalous. Okay. Um, and then last to go is going, you, you just left um, Pastor Wood all by himself because there was one kind of coming from the front. Um, Okay. Yeah, she's she's screaming for all of our people to get in the car as she's trying to start it. Let's move. I'm moving a few things around just to, so we can kind of keep track of where everybody is a little bit uh, as we kind of all sort of know. So right now there is, uh, just so everyone is, is sort of familiar, um, one of the thugs is going to jump on top of the hood uh, in front of you, and they're going to just basically stomp onto the windshield over and over and over again, Beverly. Um, not attacking you, but they're literally trying to stomp through the windshield at this point, which has already been somewhat fractured uh, by the um, by the crash. So I'm just going to roll a, br a brawl for them. There's nothing you have to roll. This is really just for them to see if they can get through the windshield in one shot. Um, and with a with a uh, <laughs> with a fumble. Uh, they, they're trying to stomp and stomp and instead they slip and they fall prone on top of the hood, the front hood of the vehicle. Okay. Very nice. <laughs> top of the round, Marie, you and Patrick are in, are kind of off the sort of driver's side. You're nearest the road probably. 
the four of you, because you now have two of these thugs that are on you, uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of like five to 20 feet or so from you, you can see Shima and this large, uh, like physically imposing woman are in a, in a brawl. Um, you can see also Beverly is, is kind of getting somewhat attacked by a man who just fell on his ass on top of the car. And you can't really see, I would say you probably can't even see what's going on with Pastor Wood because he's, it's dark, it's raining, it's on the other side. So Marie, what would you like to do? Uh, Marie is going to take this shoe that she attempted to hit with um, and realize that she is much better at throwing things. And so she is going to try to hold this up, heel first, and throw it at his face. Okay. Um, you can roll a throw, a throw test, to be honest. Like, if you wanted to roll a throw, go right ahead. That is oh, what yes. I would very much like to do, because throw is much better. Um, okay. Amazing. Uh, close enough, I think they can try to dodge, so I think I will. Uh, their dodge okay. is not as good as their fight, though. I'm going to so. spend at least 11 to succeed. Let me know if I need to spend more than 11. Yeah, you're going to need... He got a, I got 27 or 35, so I succeeded. So you're going to need a... Uh, you're going to need a hard success. So that's going to be for you 31. You're going to spend 31 points of luck to make that a hard success that you can pass. Uh, okay. I currently have 69 luck. So that'll drop me down nice. to 38. You also had 69. Luck. Didn't Shima have 68? Did you have 69? <laughs> I, did. I started with I 70 did. and then I spent one. <laughs> I okay. uh, started with 69 and I haven't spent it yet. <laughs> okay. So I'm all the way down to 38 to be able to succeed with that. Okay. Uh, so go ahead um, and we'll, you could, you could roll some damage. Um, it's a D4. D4 is fine. Give that a roll. And this is on, okay. Well, so I'll say this, the, both of them have taken some damage. Uh, I think Patrick slashed both of them actually. Nice. It's a three. Okay. I'll say on the one. A very well-made wooden shoe of the 1930s, which oh, I think yes. would hurt. <laughs> they throw it up, yes. and it gets them right in the eye. <laughs> uh, as they kind of scream down, it begins to kind of like echo in your ears. Your ears start to tremble slightly. Uh, Pastor Wood, your turn, man. Oh, all right. Uh, can I tell what kind of weapons these two near me are holding? Uh, we'll say one's got a knife cause that's the one that stabbed the driver. Uh, so, uh, number thug number one, uh, has a knife. Thug number three has brass knuckles on their fist. All right. Thug number one, then I'd like to try and rush him and use my knife to disarm him. Uh, just trying to slash at his hand, make him drop the knife. Okay. This is, uh, basically a fighting maneuver, maneuver. then if you're looking to get, if you're looking to get the disarm. Indeed it is. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, give it a roll. That is a uh, 49 under 50, a success just barely. What is your, uh, what is your brawl? Or excuse me, what is your build? Uh, zero. Okay. Uh, so let me double check his build to make sure. Cause there are a penalty die that could be imposed if, uh, their build size is different. Nope. They're also zero. Uh, they will try to dodge though. Uh, cause they are allowed to dodge and fight back just like a normal attack. Um, I'll show it to you. I'm sorry. Um, I rolled a one, uh, which gives me um, a critical wow. success. Uh, wow. As you, I, sh I shared it with you guys so you can see it because I, I, I don't. It's the second time I screwed over Steven, which is fine. Uh, no, it's fine. Uh, dodge checks. That's if they tie, they win for dodge, right? Yeah, tie, tie. So even if I spent luck down to a one, it wouldn't matter. Literally nothing you could do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's nothing you can do, unfortunately. As they do stumble out of the way, you take no damage back. They didn't fight back. They just dodged. So really, you come charging, trying to slash their arm. They pull their arm back. They go stumbling into the darkness a bit, but then they stand back up and they're ready to continue. Um, all right. Over by Shima. Um, this one is going to going to attempt to brawl again i think so shami you've got your uh, you've got your knuckles all squared away you can see she like stretches one and then you can see she slides her own on this tarnished kind of brass you can see they're they're thick and heavy they you can't even see her fingers anymore and then she charges in at you 
haymakers just wailing left and right. Um, what would you like to do? Can I fight back? Of course. Of course. Uh, go ahead and roll your brawl. Uh, so it's going to be a brawl off. And again, you need uh, to do better than she does. 15 under 85. Very, very good. Nice. How many successes is that? Is that a hard success? Uh, I don't actually know what the delta is. 15 under 15 85? Under 85. That is a hard success. Uh, or she has an extreme success. However, she also rolled an extreme success in 11 under 95. I just showed it to you in the chat. Um, <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> you know, well, guys. So freaking well. Uh, so because you were fighting back, she, uh, the, you need to beat her. And so she's going to basically just, just right across the chin and you just feel, you just feel the oh, knuckles damn. just kick in your teeth and jaw just go like almost liquefies. Um, and I will roll her damage. So her damage is similar to yours. Uh, I rolled six Ew. points of damage. Take six Amazing. points of damage. Amazing. She comes charging in with these crazy haymakers. You time it. You think you have one to kind of just pull up right on her chin. But in doing so, she steps. You stumble ever so, ever so slightly. And she just comes around with his backhand with the knuckles and catch you on the chin. And you go stumbling towards them, sliding through in the mud. Um, oh, damn. Then... Uh, we're going to go towards uh, Thug 3 over by Patrick. This is the one with the knuckles. Patrick, they're just going to attempt to punch you. Nothing special. Like you've just dove at the other thug slashing away with your knife. They're going to try to come up from behind you. I think they're going to try to do the same thing, actually. They're going to, they're going to do a fighting maneuver, and they're going to try to come up from behind and just kind of smash their arm down into yours and to see if they can just crack, like crack your forearm to get you to drop the knife. Uh, so fighting maneuver is basically what you're doing. You can dodge or fight back like normal. Good old fight back for me. Uh, I'm sorry. This was Pastor Wood. I'm sorry. I didn't mean Patrick. I meant okay. Pastor Wood. Sorry. Well, uh, I will, of course, be fighting back with my knife. Go right ahead. Uh, 19. That is a right. hard success. Okay. Well, I rolled a 94 or 50. Uh, so that is a success for you. As they come charge again, they smash you once with the farm, but they don't get you right away. You're able to whirl around with your knife and just kind of slash across their chest with their knife. Uh, roll your damage. Uh, that is five total damage. Uh, okay. Uh, five total damage, and they go, and they look down, and they say, "What do you do?" Which you're pretty sure means, "I can't believe you made me bleed my own blood," or something to that effect, <laughs> in a language <laughs> far beyond your comprehension. Um, Shima, jaw is 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 essentially it's not broken, but it's close to it. Uh, blood coming out of your mouth, maybe a tooth is loose, and this woman just grinning at you. Uh, what do you do, Shima? Uh, she's kicking your ass. She's gonna look over and spit out the blood in her mouth, <laughs> and, and then take a swing with okay. with her brass knuckles. Go right um, ahead. She will fight back because she, she's crazy. I am gonna uh, uh, remind me what audience size to. Uh, plus 10% per one you spend, you can spend two. Uh, so okay, you can so get I'm gonna at spend most 20. One. Okay. I'm, I'm going to spend one, and that gives me a 45 under 95. Go for it. I just rolled mine. Okay, Four, 45 under 95 was what I rolled. I rolled a four Are you kidding under me? 95. I'm showing you guys this in, in <laughs> no, three, so that I'm being no. as transparent as possible. Dude. Four under 95. So you rolled a 45 under 95. Yeah, that yeah. is um, not that a is, four. <laughs> that is a hard success. So you would need to spend. So what's 95 divided by five? You would need to spend. You need to get down to 19, I think. Right? Yeah, you need to get down to 19. Yeah, 19. And what? I'm pretty sure I have that much luck. So how much? Okay. So 45 minus... 26. 
Thank you. Uh, yes, I will happily spend 26 luck. Okay. Okay. And which uh, means your 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 attack will in fact go off now. So go ahead and roll your damage. Amazing. This is uh, one hell of a high quality brawl. I think between the two, it's pretty epic. This, yeah, I am really these rolls. My gosh, honestly, I mean, it, you know, it's when Jeff pretends to be our friend, like in whoa. between these fights. That's really the most hurtful part. <laughs> I enjoy when I get you guys to spend luck on <laughs> being able to identify the proper type of cat or something like that. Like, oh, man. <laughs> I can't wait till I strangle you with this tentacle monster in the next room. This is awesome. <laughs> what's oh, your man. what's the damage of that? Uh six. I uh, got a three on my D three and a three on the D four. You lay a good one into her and you see she stumbles and she looks woozy. Like you can tell this is the type of thing, like she's still standing, but you can tell she looks a little on the wooz, woozy side and she oh, yes. shouts out something. <laughs> And like everyone who can see one of these kind of looks over with sort of surprise uh, in that direction. Um, oh, no. <laughs> thug number one, uh, who is on Patrick, uh, has the knife. Patrick, you're unable to free the knife from it, is going to stab at you. Uh, and you have already fought back once and or dodged once, whatever. So you're going to, whatever you do, take a penalty die, dodge or fight back. Um, take a penalty die because you are technically overwhelmed, 2v1. Um, so, yeah, so they're just going to swing it. They're just going to try to stab you with their knife. For the record, yeah. I love they're rolling so well. God damn it. The guy is amazing. It's, I keep saying Patrick. I mean, Pastor. Pastor would. <laughs> well, I would respond if you said my name. I, I know. I, I knew something was up when you didn't say anything. Uh, I will fight back and take the uh, take a extra die. the the bad die. I forget what you call it. Penalty die. Penalty die. So that's a sixty and a forty. Uh, so sixty. Uh, I will spend the ten luck to get it down to a fifty if that helps me. Uh, that will in fact help you. All you need to do is pass. As I failed. Uh, so luck all, is all, spent. So yeah. Um, well, I mean, actually, you don't even have to spend it because I failed to hit you. So, or because but I, I was fighting back, so I wouldn't be able to hurt him unless I spent it. Oh, that's correct? right. That's a, that's right. You're fighting back. Yep, you're right. Uh, okay, roll your damage. While you do that, I'm going to switch headphones. That is four damage. I roll better on their turns than I roll on my own. <laughs> four, four damage, damage good sir. That's not bad. That's awesome, man. What are you doing? Are you not kicking okay. him with a knife? Stabbing him? So he tries He tries to stab you. He misses. You take the opportunity. You slash back. Like, this is pretty amazing if you think about it. Like, Pastor Woods 2v1-ing over here, and they're, like, slashing, punching, and he's, like, dodging, slashing, slashing. There's Hell blood yes. everywhere. This old Texas Ranger. This is great. Hell yes! <laughs> All right. Patrick Price, and I mean it this time. It is your <laughs> turn. It is your turn. <sighs> I'm going to cut at the one that's dodged this room. Absolutely. Go for it. Go for it. I think that's thug. Yeah. Big old Not eight. A, that's extreme. Holy crap. I will try to fight back. That's their standard mode of operandus here. Um, but I don't think I'm going to beat three successes, though. I've been rolling pretty freaking well. Let's be honest. <laughs> the way you've been rolling, you might. Let's, let's be honest. I was close, I guys. I was I close. That. I was very, I was very close. I rolled a, I rolled a hard success, twenty three hundred fifty. Oh. But your extreme success beats it, Patrick. So what's the damage? This will impale a bit. So max damage plus the weapon damage for seven. Nice. Seven points of damage. Nice. nice. All right. So you're, are you attacking Thug four or five there, Patrick? Four. I would say if. I would say the one that's taken more damage from the two is definitely five. Like I would say you could, you could see like the one that got hit by Marie is, is like with her shoe is kind of got it, got this, this, uh, this puncture wound in his cheek where Marie stabbed it with her heel. Then like you slash it. Number four is still looking okay. Right. Then I'll target five because my original one is the one that yeah. tried to dodge. That's fair. All right. So in that case, you guys 
as you slash into them, this one collapses to the ground as you you cut through it and they go stumbling to the ground. They try to get up and they slump back down as you, in fact, have actually done enough to thug five to put him down. Um, all right. So then the one next to him, um, thug four is going to. Hmm. It's going to grab Thug Five and start dragging him back up the road. The body of Thug Five. Um, as you hear still uh, the one that's fighting, the large woman fighting Shima, that weird voice shouting out. Like it's just vowels and sibilants like over and over and over again. It just sounds so remarkably strange. Maybe it's the rain playing tricks on you but it just doesn't sound like a language anyone is, is familiar with. They drag, they start dragging the body up. Uh, things, something seems to have changed. We'll go to Beverly. Um, Beverly, what do you do? Uh, she's trying to start this car and throw it in reverse. Okay. Um, go ahead and I'll say roll mechanical repair. As when you try to start it up, you realize the column, the steering column is all busted from it smashing into the side of the tree. Uh, so roll a mechanical repair to see if you can suss out how to kind of get this thing to, to sort of steer and start up oh, properly. No. Uh, you got resources. Uh, Not that many resources. Okay. You are... Like as you're trying to start, it's just not. And like as, even trying to s turn the wheel, you realize the column is like bent as the half the tree is kind of inside the front seat. Um, and then that's when everyone hears a gunshot. Uh, and Beverly, you hear it better than anybody because the guy that was laying down on top of the uh, on top of the hood who kind of slipped and fell stands up, pulls the gun out, and just kind of starts firing it uh, into the windshield and shouts down at Beverly and kind of and it shouts around so everyone can see. And it has the gun kind of trained directly at Beverly right now. All right. So that was the two. We go to the top of the round. Everybody heard this gunshot. Marie, you see the two that were near you, one of them, Patrick took out the other one uh, you can see is dragging that body away. The giant woman that's been fighting with Shima is shouting something and then a gunshot goes off and now they're literally pointing it at Beverly and they're looking around at each one of this crazy face, like wild eyes, crooked, rotting teeth, just grinning wildly, looking at you all like like literally trying to get you all to see this gun being pointed at Beverly as the windshield is shattered from the first, uh, the first couple, uh, gunshots. None of them went through and hit you Beverly, but like the, the windshield is shattered a bit. Marie, what do you do? Uh, so Marie had reached down and grabbed sort of her second shoe, um, as she was about to kind of throw it at kind of the one near her. And you just kind of see her turn towards the dude with the gun. Um, and she just kind of, drops her arm down a bit because you know she's got a shoe and he's got a gun so sure. she just sort of like <laughs> drops the shoe down and just sort of maintains eye contact with the guy with the gun okay pastor wood what do you do i charge the man with the gun uh he is away from you there's two next to you and then you have to climb out on top so you're you're gonna charge a guy with the gun okay if I spend my full movement, I get a melee at the end of the round. Um, I'm going to say because you're literally in like a 2v1 with two of them around you. Um, I do want to see you make a test to sort of detach yourself from them because they're not just going to like, oh, <laughs> after you go right ahead. Yeah, They may just stand in your way and just be like, yeah, you don't think you're not actually running anywhere. And your melee attack wouldn't happen until the end of the round, by the way. Uh, it doesn't, it wouldn't happen at the end of your turn. It would literally happen at the end of the round. Right. So everybody else can do stuff, including this guy could shoot Beverly in the head. Just so you know, mechanically. 
that's a chance I'm willing to take. <laughs> <laughs> that feels like a chance Steven is willing to take and maybe not a chance that Pastor right. Wood would be willing to take. Maybe. Give me, give me just a dex roll uh, to see if you can sort of elude the, the arms of these guys as you try to push past them and then climb, uh, climb that up. That is a 74. I needed a 70, so I will spend the points of luck if I can. Yeah. Okay. So they're grabbing at you, slashing at you, and you stumble past them, and you start clamoring up over... Maybe you're just climbing up the back of the vehicle and just climbing up the back over top. Uh, as we will go to the giant woman who's been fighting Shima. she grins blood dripping down from this crooked rotten mouth she she like reaches in with her giant like giant ham hock of a hand covered in this bloody brass knuckle and she pulls out this bloody wad of paper and she just steps up to you shima it looks like she's swinging back to throw it at you but instead she just shoves it like firmly like right into your hand and then starts walking back up the slope in the direction she's not gonna do that that far but in the direction uh that the the one that one whose body was being dragged away is going um the third one uh let's see so thug number three who is trying to grasp a pastor wood um yeah uh, they're going to, yeah, they're going to just basically run off into the darkness. Uh, and then we go to Shima. Uh, Shima is like pure instinct right now. <laughs> so uh, she's turning into Dr. Key uh, as quickly as possible. Okay. So whatever she I needs really to I want to stress to you guys like you're not going to get there like the gunshot's going to go off before you guys get there and the gun has the okay. potential to do a lot of damage. So just just like you can do what exactly what Pastor Wood did, but you running up and then doing a melee isn't going to resolve before a gunshot. So there's right. still going to be a shot off. Okay. 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 Um okay. in in that case that maybe uh, fuck the pot of my moving over there is gonna help. Um, uh, she did just this, show this woman. This woman she, has turned her back to me. She's walking away from me. She, she did not? just. She did just shove a bloody note in your chest, like literally in your chest. Right. She took a crumpled up piece of paper. Uh, look at the paper. I, yeah, I'm gonna look at it. <laughs> okay. And then just undo it too. Uh, okay, so you see, I'll go ahead and share it with you. The note, this bloody note, typed out, like like actual typewriter. It says, with blood all over it now, it's, it's, it's getting wet and raining. It's almost becoming tissue paper. But you can read two brief phrases. Drop this case, go home. Can I still do any, like, do an action or... You can do whatever you want, but what I will tell you is that they have threatened to kill one of your people, are now breaking off the combat. If you would like to continue to do things to accelerate that combat, I'd be more than happy to have them turn around and continue to accelerate it as well. So just do whatever you like. I just want you guys to do it. Right, right, right. Uh, uh. I I think Shama is going to very, very piss off, gonna just take a lot of heaving breaths and not move. And it takes every ounce of willpower that she has to not go off in this moment. Okay. <laughs> uh then uh, Thug One uh will also disappear. Uh, into the night. Uh, that was the one that was trying to, to sort of grab after Pastor Wood. Patrick, we come back to you. You just you, you see within just a handful of footsteps of you, you can see one of the ones, the one that you took down 
is dr- is getting dragged away like by a leg. It's just like like almost like it's like it's like a fresh kill, like without any concern for them whatsoever. Just grab them by the ankle, and the other one is dragging them back onto this like muddy road. They're right there. Like you're welcome to charge after them. I don't want to tell you you can't, but you also just saw. You just heard a gunshot, and now Beverly has got a gun pointed at her head. Uh, what would you like to do? I'm going to stand and watch. Okay. All right. All right. The next one to go uh, is just the one that's dragging the body, and so they'll continue to drag the body. Beverly, uh, you are next. You are in the front seat of this car. Uh, glass is essentially fra- like shattered, and you're covered in it. Uh, there is a gun pointed directly at your face, just a couple inches away, by this heaving, crazed-looking man. What would you like to do? Um, I think she would do like the typical, where she just puts her hands up, like she's not trying to do anything else, like "Please don't hurt me," okay. kind of thing. Okay. So, with two of them moving out into the night, with the thug boss having delivered the note and turned away, having one of them dragging the leg of the one that Patrick managed to disable back onto the street. This other one briefly lowers their gun away from Beverly and looks like they're getting ready to climb off the hood. But then Pastor Wood goes scrambling over the back of the car and their gun flips up and shoots Pastor Wood. So this is going to be, which one is this? It's like two. All right. It's not their best skill, unfortunately. Am I close enough? I could dodge. Uh, so a dodge uh, for a gun, you're going to need to basically drop to the ground. So you would uh, uh, like, so if you're, if you're looking to, to do that, you would essentially, um, like hit the, hit the ground. There's a, there's a phrase for it. It's, um, yeah, I'm looking remember. at the firefight cheat sheet now and I'm, there's a, there's a word for, for it. Die for cover. Okay. That's what it is. Okay. So you could die for cover. You can kind of throw yourself off the car if you want. There is a penalty die because it's going against a firearm. Mm-hmm. Sorry, couldn't get my unmute. Uh, yes, I will dive for cover with the penalty die. Okay, go for it. 86 and a 46. Uh, my dodge is 55, so that means I need to spend 31 luck to make that a success, which I will okay. do. Okay. Uh, then you do, in fact, fall, like jump off the car. The bullet whizzes past you. It hits a random tree behind the car somewhere. Uh, You all hear the gunshot go off. You see Pastor Wood like leap off the top of this this uh, this car like and flop down into the mud. Um, You hear the voice of that giant woman like bellow out again in the direction of the one that's like on top of the uh, on top of the hood of the car. Uh, And you see them like hop back off instead of continuing to like fire at Pastor Wood. Um, Pastor Wood, you dove off of the car. I'll say if you want, you can make a throw uh, as you're probably close enough to resolve a throw test if you want. No, I wouldn't throw anything at him. It's all right. Okay. All right. So they they start just sort of running, like moving back up to the uh, to the road itself. You guys hear this screech and this car comes like fishtailing, like hydroplaning on the road, uh, like big eruptions of mud spreading out onto the ground. And like, they just kind of haphazardly just shove the body uh, of the one that Patrick uh, took out, like into a trunk and they kind of start to climb in. And right as the, like the, the giant woman climbs in, she looks back at you all. She looks down at Shima and she just, puts a finger up to her throat and drags it across and she makes this rotten, nasty smile. The car begins to go and she just kind of grabs it by the running board. And you can see all, you can see the whole car just beginning to sort of pile down the road at that point in the darkness. Eventually the car fades, the rain's still going. Beverly, you're coated in, you're coated in blood from the driver, glass from the windshield. A couple of you have taken some injuries. 
What do you do? Yeah, Beverly would immediately turn to the driver and try and do whatever she can for him. First day would be great if you want to give that, as he is not in great shape. I would like to take a dice for him just in case. Sure. So you have 19 to spend? 29. 29, sorry. Uh, I'll spend it. Okay. I'll say with that, you manage to kind of stop the profuse bleeding. And you think there's a decent chance he'll live uh, if you can get him to a hospital in a sufficient amount of time. Get him to an actual doctor, get some, you know, clean the wound out, stitch it up, that kind of thing. See if there's any internal injuries. But you're pretty sure that's enough for now to keep him... um, to keep him okay. Um, there is on the scene, there is the other vehicle that they use to crash into yours, which is pretty total. There's your vehicle, which is fairly total. Um, the, there's a busted steering column and the rain's pouring down. And I'll say the last thing we'll do before we leave is we see you guys just standing there in the mud as the note drop this case go home is like on the ground maybe getting filled up with a puddle of muddy water and we'll go ahead and end there and we'll pick up on that next week oh my gosh god damn uh, how do they even know who we I just, are yet i just love like it's like steve's like I'm, I'm willing to risk that i'm like <laughs> i feel like are you gonna get ashley shot in the head Again? Again? <laughs> Again? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, Jeff, that was so good. Oh, right? man, that was so good. Oh, my gosh. Combat is horrible, and we should avoid it at all costs. <laughs> that is, you learned the That's, lesson. Then. You learned the lesson. That is, fantastic. yeah. The lesson Wait, is to is carry it went well the for club me. and the knife. That's the lesson I learned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, like... They a couple of them had guns, but they weren't using guns unless you guys accelerated stuff. But um, but yeah, uh, that was fun. That was fun. Um, interestingly, eh, I won't reveal too much anyway. But yeah, we'll we will pick up right there next time. Uh, we'll pick up in the rain. Uh, your car crash. Uh, we won't have to play the whole thing out. But your 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 total car, their total car, uh, and your uh, your driver is in rough state. But but with the first aid, is probably yeah. not going to immediately die. Uh, but we'll put it there. All right. Our bruises and bruised egos and all of it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. That uh, was so great, Jeff. I had a lot of fun. Uh, I really wanted to shoot Steven, though. Uh, I was so sad. Because <laughs> <laughs> I actually failed my role. Uh, they are much better at punching than they are at firing guns, as you might expect. Holy shit, you were rolling such fire, man. That's yeah. amazing. I know. That's so good. Yeah. That's so good. But my 72 over 35 when I was trying to shoot Pastor Wood as he cram- scrambled <laughs> over the car. So. I felt safe with my luck for uh, dodging. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, you <laughs> ate up my luck today. I started today with 99, and I now have 13. Ching. And these oh are just gosh. these are just random yeah. people too. Imagine when you get back to your hotel and actually fight the tentacle monster I have hit in, <laughs> in Pastor Wood's room. That's too soon, Jack. Too soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, call I mean Call of Duty Combat is it's it's brutal. Like it is brutal. Like it's like you're just normal people. That's why I like Call of Duty though. It's like it's like you're you're playing like relatively normal people. You guys are slightly tougher. Yeah. yeah. Cause we did pulp Cthulhu for character creation. So you have more HP. So it's harder to kill you. And like each of you has like a pulp talent and stuff. So you're slightly tougher, uh, but it's still, yeah, you can So you're it, like, it's going to be a lot harder to one shot you guys basically, but <laughs> not impossible. Uh, not impossible. All right. Yikes. Let's do a couple clothes and plugs and then we'll get on out of here. We'll start with my trade. My trade. Where can we find you on the, uh, the interwebs? Uh, when I am not forcing my friendship on these lovely people, <laughs> I am mighty plays games on YouTube. Uh, one of my goals for next year is to try and do YouTube more regularly. So, uh, check me out if you're in the market for system agnostic tabletop stuff. Fantastic. Uh, link is in the chat. If you're re- if you're watching this later on YouTube, check uh, check the show notes and stuff. I have links to to everyone's various socials, channels, etc., all that kind of stuff. Uh, 
then for us, what do we have next? Next, speaking of Maitre forcing her friendship on us, Monday, she's doing it again uh, as we're playing some Fried Empire. Uh, you can see myself, Melissa, Maitre, we're playing some wonderful space sci-fi. Really looking forward to it. Very fun game. Very fun crew. Um, Tuesday, Stephen, what's going on, man? We're playing more Mar Marvel Multiverse. I was trying to put Marvel and Multiverse into the same word. You said Marvel. Uh, <laughs> it's an X-Men <laughs> game uh, and we currently have a giveaway that ends in like two days or something like that so sure. go check out our YouTube channel go to the most recent Marvel game uh, and leave a comment Yeah, uh, just tell us how much you enjoy lollygaggers or something like that and you'll be entered for a chance to win absolutely absolutely and uh, if you do do that um, check later because I'm going to let you know via that comment whether you win or not so, uh, so you might want to check that that's how you're notified <laughs> Um, let's see what else we have next Thursday. We've got some, uh, where the apocalypse. That's our, that's, that's, uh, that's been going on a lot of fun there. Um, and then Friday Delta green, uh, everyone here, uh, but my tray because, um, she decided she's going to give us a break. Thankfully, oh gosh, <laughs> it's just so awful. So, uh, yeah. And then we'll be back on Saturday with more of this and we'll see what happens. We yes, need actually. a day to yearn for her, you know. Ah, that's, oh, fair. that's fair. There you, you gotta go. balance it out. There you definitely, go. It's definitely a fail. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's get on out of here. Let's go ahead and raid Dork Tales. Looks like they're playing something on Twitch that looks like a role playing game. So we're gonna do that. Thanks for everyone going out tonight. Thank you uh, for the raids uh, and uh, thank you for, uh, for just hanging out. So have a great rest of your weekend. I'll see you later. Bye bye. Bye. Hey, see you, everybody. There.